morning, everybody. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Agati, I speak talking from Italy, and uh, I would like to thank all of you and all the speakers to be here for the, our incredible meeting on uh, uh, hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Um, we are very proud of ourselves. It was amazing. Have more than uh, 19 countries connect at the same time with our staff. And this is um, a very big pleasure for me only to introduce what is the Congenital Art Academy that is, uh, you can see very well, a web-based educational platform that I share with uh, Professor Gil Bernowski who start uh, to collaborate with us. Mostly of the, uh, our, uh, we are looking uh, for a lot of uh, new strategy for connection the world. And this is one of the, and at the end, the, we can offer also the national fellowship. So thank you very much. I don't believe, I really believe that it was, is not important how big or small is your hospital. The most important things is that we take care of our children in the best way we can. And uh, we are here also in uh, such a complex moment to support all the program around the world with a very open uh, access to our platform. So with a big, big pleasure is now the moment of uh, starting the meeting. And uh, Professor Anderson, I have a, an answer to him because I know very well what is his opinion. The question is, is there a real good name for uh, hypoplastic left heart syndrome? It means we are a really good nomenclature and classification for the disease. Thanks, Professor Bob Anders. Please mute your phones, everyone. Are you able to hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Yes. Okay. Yes, I hear you across the Atlantic. Thank you. So we're discussing hypoplasia of the left ventricle. Well, we know that the left ventricle can be hyperplastic in various settings. Totally anomalous pulmonary venous connection, for example. The left ventricle is small, but we're not going to be discussing that today. It's small, we have double outlet right ventricle with mitral atresia. And again, we will not be discussing that. Oftentimes, when you have a VSD with coarctation, the left ventricle is small. But that's not what we're talking about. It could be that we'll be discussing aortic coarctation when the ventricular septum is intact. And in some instances, we may consider that to be part of the entity we're discussing today. We certainly are not discussing atrioventricular septal defect with right ventricular dominance, although it is the size of the left ventricle that is key there in clinical decision making. What we are talking about today is the hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And there's no question in my mind that that is a distinct entity. And what I'd like to try to do over the next 14 or minutes or so is persuade you that it is an acquired disease of fetal life. Because if we look at the basic features, what links together the entity with essentially concordant atrioventricular and ventricular arterial connection. And when we look at the different parts that we put together into this syndrome, we see that there is a spectrum of disease, and that's what I'm going to be illustrating for you. So the subgroups, some of the hearts that we describe within the syndrome, of the combination of mitral and aortic atresia. And that is the worst end of the spectrum. If we move a little bit forward, we find cases where the mitral valve is stenotic, the aortic valve remains atretic. And there we are in the middle 
of the spectrum. As we move to the better end, we come to the cases in which both the mitral and aortic valves are stenotic, but still they are presenting to us as part and parcel of the hyperplastic left heart syndrome. But then at the best end of the syndrome, we have the so-called complex. Is this part of the syndrome? I think it is, and I'll discuss with you why I think this is the best end of what we see as this acquired disease of fetal life. Now the material I'm going to present to you today is very much the work of these two people. Diane Spicer is a lady who I first met a long time ago now in 1982 when she came as a pathologist assistant when I was working in Pittsburgh. She is now a consummate anatomist in her own right and the beautiful pictures you will see are all down to Diane and by my understanding she's listening and she's part of our <laughs> webinar today so hi Diane. Diane and I, over the past year or so, have also been working with Elizabeth Stevens. Elizabeth at the time was training with Carl Backer at uh, the Lurie Hospital in Chicago. She's now what we call a consultant, an attending pediatric cardiac surgeon at the Mayo Clinic. And it's Elizabeth who put all of this work together. And if you're interested, you can find more detailed accounts in these two manuscripts that are waiting to be published. They'll, they will appear in seminars of thoracic and cardiovascular surgery. They're already obtainable in DOI form. And this is the basis of what I'm going to be presenting to you now over the next 10 minutes or so. So let's start by looking at the anatomic features of the combination of mitral and aortic atresia. So this is what we see. This is one of Diane's beautiful images. You're looking at the diaphragmatic surface of a heart that has combined aortic and mitral atresia. And when we look at this as morphologists, we are taken by these delimited <coughs> coronary arteries because they show us where on the diaphragmatic surface of the ventricular mass we can find the left ventricle. And it is truly tiny. The key point, it does not have any fibroelastosis. And the presence or absence of fibroelastosis is the theme that I'm going to be developing as I show you the spectrum of disease. So this is one heart. There you see the tiny ventricle and you see there are remnants of the tension apparatus of the mitral valve within that tiny right ventricle. This is another one with aortic and mitral atresia. And what you see here again, the left ventricle, no fibroelastosis, very small, a little larger than the one I showed you a moment ago, because this time Diane has demonstrated to you by making a so-called four-chamber section through a heart that was an explant. And what we see very nicely here is that the atresia is due to an imperforate mitral valve. And that tells us that as part and parcel of this syndrome at some stage during development, the mitral valve was formed, what you will see the aortic valve was formed, the embryonic interventricular communication closed. So essentially we have concordant atrioventricular, concordant ventricular arterial connections, but here the mitral atresia as consequence of the imperforate mitral valve. Another of Diane's beautiful four chamber sections, this time with an intact heart. And once again, you see this imperforate mitral valve it is blocking the left atrioventricular connection. So we started off with concordant atrioventricular connections. This time the left ventricle is even smaller, but there is no fibroelastosis. And this is the feature of the tiny left ventricle in combined aortic and mitral atresia. The commonest example of this entity, however, 
present themselves with what seems to be absence of the left atrioventricular connection. But if we look very carefully, we can see that there is the suggestion here within this really slit-like left ventricle at what of some stage has been the mitral valve. And this is what persuades me that this is the worst end of the spectrum. The heart started off normally and sometime during life, the fetal life after the closure of the embryonic interventricular communication, the left ventricle stopped growing. And there it is, a minute left ventricle, again, no fibroelastosis. Note in this instance, the atrial septum is intact and has become aneurysmal. And we know that this is one of the bad prognostic features of the overall syndrome, integrity of the atrial septum. And in this chart, prepared for me by my good friend and colleague, Andrew Cook, we see that the pulmonary veins are thickened. The so-called arterialization of the pulmonary veins. This also has an effect on the lungs. lungs. We have the cobblestone appearance, and we see the gross lymphangiectasia. And this is a very bad prognostic feature. But if we return back to combined aortic and mitral atresia, what we found when we looked at the 119 specimens that formed the basis of our investigation, the size of the ascending aorta is reflecting the tiny size of the left ventricle. And here the ascending aorta is no more than a conduit that is feeding blood in retrograde fashion down to the coronary arteries. We also see a feature of many of these cases, reductal co-optation. And we know that the co-optation lesion is ductal tissue. When we trace it, it is continuous with the wall of the arterial duct. And in this instance, you see that the ductal tissue also extends to encircle the origin of the left subclavian artery. And this is another potentially important finding. So the conduit extends down to the base of the heart, as you see here, and there it feeds the aortic root. And look at the size of the tiny ascending aorta relative to the right and left coronary arteries. In the past, some even described this as anomalous origin of the coronary arteries from the brachiocephalic artery. But we now know that this is part and parcel of the syndrome with a minute ascending aorta. So let's move forward and let's look at the second subset of our syndrome, mitral atresia. Might, it's the wrong way around, I apologize. This is a bad slide. It should be mitral stenosis combined with aortic atresia. My apologies, I will correct that. So here, the left ventricle is bigger. We have mitral stenosis. But then when we look at the outflow tract of the heart, we see that initially there was a communication between the left ventricle and aorta, potentially concordant connections, but blocked by a fibrous membrane between the aortic root and the left ventricle. But here is the bugbear, fibroelastosis. Here in an explanted specimen, we see the peach pip left ventricle, the fibroelastosis, and it involves the tension apparatus of the mitral valve. And this is what the late Robert Friedem called blighted myocardium. This is the anterior part of that specimen which Diane prepared. And there you see the shelf that is blocking the passage that initially existed between left ventricle the ascending aorta, essentially concordant ventricular arterial connections. And here is another big problem, a fistulous communication. We have microscopic communications with the coronary arteries in almost all of these cases, but in some instances they can become particularly large. And then this is another bad prognostic feature. Note that the aortic root is of better size because the left ventricle is that much larger. But the bad news, ectatic coronary arteries reflecting these fistulous communications. So here is the ascending aorta when we have mitral stenosis aortic atresia. 
and it's of much better size. But again, beware of the coarctation. We have coarctation in all subsets of syndrome. So let's move forward and let's look at the case where not only the mitral valve is stenotic, but also the aortic valve. Seen beautifully here in another of Diane's exquisite demonstrations, this time showing you the parasternal long axis equivalent. Mitral stenosis, this time with aortic stenosis. The pathway from the left ventricle, the aortic root is patent, and I interpret this as whatever stopped the left ventricle growing was later during fetal life than in the cases I've shown you thus far. But look again, even though we have aortic and mitral stenosis, we have a bigger left ventricle, but look at the extent of this fibroelastosis. And I believe this reflects the abnormal flow through the mitral valve. And Pedro is well aware of the significance of fibroelastosis. I'm sure he'll be discussing that. And he and his colleagues have written on that in the past year. A somewhat bigger left ventricle here, again with mitral stenosis, aortic stenosis, but look again, the fibroelastosis that is lining the surface of this left ventricle. When we have the aortic stenosis, in our experience, it is the consequence of the so-called unicuspid and unicommissural variant. And the essence here is that there is a reduction in the so-called, there is, there is reduction in the semilunar attachment of the leaflets so that paradoxically we see an aortic ring best when the valve itself is malformed. But if we look carefully, we see here the raphase showing us where there has been no excavation of the interleaflet triangles here, the only opening coming back towards the mitral valve. And this Professor is Anderson. a of combined aortic and mitral stenosis. Again, bigger aorta, still oftentimes with coarctation. So let's finish our discussion with looking at the hypoplastic left heart complex. And here we see another parasternal long axis equivalent, left ventricle bigger, but now the valves are proportionate to the size of the left ventricle. And we found this in several of our hearts, apex forming right ventricle telling us we're in the syndrome in some with fibroelastosis again with a hypoplastic arch here's another one apex forming left ventricle less fibroelastosis this time and this the best of our examples of the so-called hypoplastic complex no fibroelastosis this time much bigger left ventricle but still with right ventricle apex forming the proportionate sizes of the mitral and aortic valves. And potentially, these are the cases that lend themselves to biventriculate repair. So I've concentrated on the left ventricle, but let's not forget the associated malformations. Oftentimes, the tricuspid valve is abnormal. We shouldn't forget the so-called levoatrial cardinal vein, which is neither levoatrial nor cardinal but that's what we call it. It provides an overflow for the left atrium when that is obstructed, as does fenestration of the coronary sinus. And rarely on occasion, we can have anomalous pulmonary venous connections. But you must be aware of anything. So here is one fascinating heart. It has aortic atresia combined with mitral atresia, but this unexpected finding right juxtaposition of the atrial appendages. So if I wrap up, what I believe I've shown you is an acquired disease of fetal life. Now I'm not doubting there can be genetic predisposition, predisposition this entity, but all the morphological evidence tells us that the heart itself at some stage was formed in normal fashion. So the unifying features are the integrity, of the ventricular septum with concordant atrioventricular ventricular arterial connections. The bad news, the fibroelastosis, we see that only in my experience when the mitral valve is stenotic rather than being atretic. 
and much has been written by alleged mouse models, but to my mind, as yet, we have not seen a mouse model that reflects this acquired disease of fetal life. So there we have the essence of the hyperplastic left heart syndrome from the anatomic stance. So I'll pass you back now to the moderators because that's the anatomy. Ashley, do you want to go ahead, please? Or do you have someone else uh, planned? Morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. The next speaker is directly to the surgical strategies for hypoplastic left heart syndrome. He is uh, Professor Pedro Del Nido, who is the chief of uh, pediatric cardiac surgery in Boston Children's Hospital. And uh, he will talk us about the, the his experience it is the uh, management for hypoplastic left heart syndrome in his experience so thank you very much for accepting our invitation thank you um, if we could go back for some reason i'm not able to control my my presentation i just ended it one well, start restarting it and it should be okay i can always do remote control if that doesn't work Okay. There you go. Yeah, well, yeah. No, starting the same, same issue. We're working on it, Dr. Del Nido. We should have it fixed in a sec. Yeah, I think you're, you're controlling my presentation. Yeah, I'm looking for your window. I'm going to stop controlling it, but you just move that uh, email out of the way. And your PowerPoint is located where? In another screen. There you go. OK. No, I can't see it. I'm going to give up remote control. Why don't you put that front and center on, show it, um, put PowerPoints on the window we're looking at right now, right on top of your email. Can you and see it now? We can see it. And if you click share, hopefully, if, I'm sorry, if you click slideshow, hopefully it'll work from there. Uh, I'm in slideshow mode now. Okay, let me just do one thing, stay where you are. At the, there should be a, a swap at the top left of your screen. You should be able to swap which PowerPoint you're sharing. I can't see it because it's very small on my screen. You can go back to that presenter view you were just in. There should be a PowerPoint button that says display sharing and you'll just select the other monitor. So go back to that slideshow mode you're in. Yeah, you're, you're controlling my... Um... Yep, let me give that up. Sorry about that. Okay, uh, at the upper left, I can't see it, but there might be something that says display sharing. It's, in, it's on the um, presenter mode, and it'll say swap share. There you go. So now we're seeing it. So if you back up, we should be at the start of your slides. Okay, can you see me now? Uh, we see the fetal intervention slide. Uh, do you see the beginning of my presentation yet? I, I do not. Yes. If other people yes. are seeing it, I would say proceed. I'm not yes. seeing it. But it's okay. Can you can you see it? Yes. yes. Okay. okay. That's perfect. Yes. All right. Let me go ahead then. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the um, invitation to uh, to participate in this very interesting meeting, both on the topic and also the. Uh, 
the venue, which um, um, I, I'm, uh, uh, is likely to become the, the way that we communicate in the future. So I was asked to talk about uh, the surgical management of hypoplastic left heart syndrome and what my thoughts about strategy uh, are. And I'll very quickly go through some of our current thinking about um, management of these patients. And as, as um, many of you know, we've, we've looked at this as a disease process that goes throughout life, uh, including um, the early fetal intervention. There's gonna be a presentation later on uh, about uh, more details about both the fetal uh, interventions and also some of the alternative uh, uh, strategies, surgical strategies, such as hybrid procedures. So I'm gonna mention them, but not really cover them in detail and really leave to the other speakers to go into it. We've been interested in fetal intervention primarily because our approach has always been to try to recruit uh, a biventricular circulation. And we've utilized the concept that I think Bob Anderson touched upon, uh, and that is that there are, uh, there's a wide spectrum of this disease, but importantly, there are different mechanisms for different forms of the disease um, that may play a role uh, in, in, the, in the formation of the full spectrum of, of hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So we've explored ways to try to intervene based on our thinking about the mechanism. So we'll start with a fetal intervention. And as, as Bob mentioned, these, this is aimed at a subgroup of patients. It's based on the original observation uh, way back in, in, the, in the UK that in fact, um, these ventricles do form early on, but because of, of uh, blood flow or hemodynamic reasons, they actually stop growing. And so what we're looking at here is a subgroup of the, of the hypoplastic left heart syndrome uh, spectrum which is uh, fetuses that have mitral stenosis and more likely primarily aortic stenosis. And so the, the concept here is that if the aortic stenosis occurs at a particular time in the fetal development, for whatever the genetic reasons are, um, that that actually determines the, the uh, long-term outcome. So the fetal intervention was started uh, by Jim Locke and Audrey Marshall at our center. Uh, and have been continued by Diego Porras um, uh, in our center. And, and again, I won't go into the great, in, any details, but the concept here was a very straightforward one, which was if the primary lesion is an aortic valve problem, then perhaps opening the aortic valve in order to induce more flow through this chamber would actually result in growth. So that was a hypothesis. Um, the results, and this is our most recent data, is that by and large, if you time this properly, and typically we're looking at somewhere around 20 to 23 weeks gestation in children who have an, a mitral valve that's open and who have an aortic valve that has some flow or at least a remnant of an aortic mm -hmm. valve there, they are considered candidates. So we've, they've done uh, now up to 100, over 140 of these patients. Still about a, a, uh, an 8% uh, fetal loss. So this is not a, a procedure without risk. Live-born patients is the vast majority. Uh, some um, have succumbed from early com other complications early before an intervention could be made. But roughly about 50% of these um, have uh, what we would call a biventricular circulation. And, I, and I, we use that term rather than a normal circulation because these children still have valvular heart disease. And so they most likely will require further interventions to address their valvular heart disease, which is primarily aortic, although it can also include the mitral. The long-term results are encouraging. If you are able to achieve the biventricular circulation, which is what we're showing here in red, um, in fact, the long-term survival of these children uh, up to about six years seems to be superior to the long-term survival of a comparable group that underwent basically simple single ventricle management. This is data of a, a comparable group that was obtained, um, a matched group from the single ventricle uh, reconstruction trial data. So it's not a, a perfect comparison, but it is at least gives us an idea that in fact, if you select these patients well um, and, and you have the technical capabilities of doing it, then 
uh, it is very much of a worthwhile effort um, in an effort to, to maintain biventricular circulation. The conventional approach, however, is what's described here. Uh, in children who are born uh, with hypoplastic left heart um, uh, complex or syndrome, um, they have um, a generally been approached by a staged palliative set of procedures, uh, which I'll talk about in some detail that we've looked at in, 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 um, in a more systematic way to try to improve the overall results of the single ventricle approach. And then towards the end, I'll mention a little bit about our work trying to recruit the ventricles in the uh, subset of patients. So the traditional approach has been to uh, reconstruct the arterial connections in a way that the right ventricle is capable of supporting the circulation because it is obviously the primary pumping chamber. And it can do it in an unobstructed fashion uh, to perfuse both the upper half of the body as well as the lower half. The challenge has always been controlling pulmonary blood flow, that balance uh, in a parallel circulation, the balance between systemic perfusion and um, pulmonary perfusion. The shunt um, was the, always the initial uh, approach until um, Shunji Sano proposed, actually Bill, William, uh, Bill Norwood uh, originally proposed it, but Shunji uh, uh, modified it in a way that it actually be became practical, which is to uh, provide um, anti-grade flow from the anatomic right ventricle into the branch pulmonary arteries via a tubular conduit. This is considered the first stage procedure. This component of the surgery, along with enlargement of the inner atrial communication, is the fundamental step um, that, uh, and the fundamental concept of stabilizing these children until they can have a stage separation of their circulation. And this is done, uh, in this case, I'm showing you a bidirectional Glenn connection connecting the superior vena cable blood flow to the branch pulmonary arteries, in this case, eliminating the alternative blood flow from either a shunt or the conduit. Many, many variants of this, but the general concept is that now you're taking systemic venous blood and, uh, and diverting it directly to the pulmonary circulation, still leaving the inferior cable blood flow mixing until the second, the second component of the cable pulmonary connection, which is what we call the Fontan circulation. Um, and ultimately, this is the, the goal of this approach, uh, thinking that these children are, have improved oxygenation, although their physiology is clearly not normal, but they have an acceptable uh, physiology for at least one or two decades uh, of life. Alternative approaches um, have been described and actually perfected now, and I'm not gonna cover this because I think uh, Dr. Galantowicz is gonna cover it in much more detail. He has a vast experience in this, uh, with this approach. Um, and it's certainly a very, very good alternative, particularly in children who are um, at very high risk of a uh, long bypass procedure. Now we have very good data looking at the different aspects of the first stage operation. Uh, that this is the data that I think most of you are very familiar with. This is the long-term results of the single ventricle reconstruction trial where they compared the RV to PA conduit versus a BT shunt. And they found that there is a survival advantage, albeit a relatively small one. Uh, and, and that is that survival advantage was seen not only at a year, but it sort of sustains itself much less so uh, once you get out to five to six years. When you look at the timing of the second uh, of the Fontan operation, there was really very little difference. So it had very little impact on the ultimate management of these patients, but it certainly uh, did seem to have an impact on the, uh, on the early survival. We were interested in this concept because we um, were an early participant in this uh, single ventricle reconstruction trial. Um, and we noticed that there are complications or problems with the concept of the conduit that we wanted to address. Number one was the proximal stenosis, which occurs not infrequently in these patients. And then the other is the, uh, uh, the, the, the concept that this is a simple tube. Uh, normally we have a valve in the pulmonary circulation, but the original concept of a simple tube uh, could lead to regurgitation. 
So we've looked at the, the um, um, approach to the proximal end that was uh, described by Jim Tweddle, I think early on uh, in the experience, which was this dunking technique uh, where you use a, a reinforced ring tube graft, in this case, uh, typically a five millimeter ringed uh, tube graft, and you insert it directly so that a component of the ring graft is actually inside the cavity. And this is as opposed to the traditional method, which is suturing the Gore-Tex onto a, um, a, a hole that you create by resecting muscle. Uh, and that leads to hopefully an unobstructed pathway into the conduit. This is a very different idea. And this is simply that you're gonna have prosthesis um, protruding into the lumen and therefore much less likely that muscle tissue will, will uh, cause obstruction. So we looked at this, um, um, it, it, it this technique. This is a, a video. Um, I hope this is showing well, but uh, this is a video of um, uh, the actual technique that we okay. use here. Um, this is, uh, th we don't resect tissue. We simply are pushing it away with a, um, uh, a hemostat. And then we have a pre-marked, based on the thickness of the ventricle, we have a pre-marked distance that gets uh, inserted into the ventricular chamber. This is done after the arch reconstruction is completed. Um, and you're simply tacking tissue around the, um, uh, the vortex uh, ring graft in for, uh, primarily for hemostasis and to stabilize um, this uh, patch. When we looked at the results of this uh, uh, in, in our experience, and, and we had um, uh, two um, groups of patients that uh, were um, subjected to either the dunking technique or to the traditional suture technique. We started off with uh, 29 patients in the dunk, 27 in the traditional. What we found is that the probability of freedom from proximal stenosis was far lower in the dunk, particularly as you look out uh, several months, uh, we, you begin to see problems with proximal stenosis in the, in the traditional um, and the uh, probability from, from uh, significant stenosis um, is uh, substantially better. The, the, the suture group begins to develop some degree of flow acceleration, typically at about two, three months after um, the initial insertion and continues thereafter. So we felt based on this technique that the dunking tech, uh, uh, method uh, worked quite a bit better and that's our standard. We then looked at the regurgitation, the concept that some of the pulmonary blood flow is ineffective because of, of uh, pulmonary regurgitation and in fact could potentially lead to volume loading. And we looked at this concept of utilizing a valve um, to try to um, uh, prevent the regurgitation. This is a, a femoral vein um, that comes, uh, it's a human, it's a homograft, human femoral vein. We support that femoral vein with an outside uh, stent that uh, prevents it from becoming aneurysmal and also allows us to regulate the diameter. Uh, this vein uh, is um, uh, then sutured uh, onto the actual Gore-Tex graft. So the, the, the stent prevents the aneurysmal dilation, so maintains the actual diameter. The, the um, uh, vein is then sutured to the Gore-Tex graft which will be used to, uh, to connect uh, uh, the right ventricle to the, um, the pulmonary. And so this prevents the, uh, the regurgitation. In the interest of time, I'm gonna move ahead. We looked at early results, uh, and this is the, there is the, the uh, results with um, need for pulmonary artery intervention when we used a femoral vein graft in red versus a saphenous vein graft in black compared to a control group which had our standard uh, Gore-Tex dunking method. They, they both had the dunking method, but what we found is in fact, that the, the number of times that we had to intervene, um, mostly by catheter, uh, in the distal branch pulmonary arteries when we used the, the, uh, the valve was less. Uh, the explanation for this is, is a little bit unclear, but uh, we do think that certainly part of it is that the effective pulmonary blood flow is greater with these patients. When we looked at the early uh, hemodynamic results, uh, they generally tended to have a higher oxygen saturation uh, compared to the cortex alone group. So there did seem to be evidence that at least there was more effective pulmonary blood flow when you placed the valve in these patients. 
So our current experience um, overall, this is taking all uh, stage one uh, um, comers. Uh, we, we typically do somewhere between uh, 20 and 30, uh, and sometimes a little higher uh, um, hypoplasts per year. Um, and overall, the mortality has been gradually improving. We had a good year last year. In general, the mortality is somewhere less than 10%. So in summary, uh, for at least the single ventricle management of hypoplastic left heart syndrome, our approach is that the, we believe that the SANO RV to PA conduit appears to provide better stage one palliation. The dunking technique reduces the incidence of proximal conduit stenosis and uh, that a valve in that conduit uh, may uh, result in, in uh, better uh, pulmonary artery uh, anatomy for a cable pulmonary connection. I'll mention just very quickly a couple of concepts that we have pursued and, you, um, and we have tried to publish on, and that is the concept of ventricular recruitment for this patients. These are mitral stenosis, aortic stenosis, patients with endocardial fibrolastosis. And as Bob Anderson, I think, showed in beautiful pictures, uh, this is a, we believe this is a restrictor to ventricular growth. And so we have undertaken from the neonatal period to the, to the uh, uh, at the time of the Glen, resecting as much of this tissue as possible, including tissue on papillary muscles in an effort to try to get these ventricles to grow. We do believe in the theory that opening up the inflow so that we increase blood flow into this chamber, it's the flow that makes the chamber grow. It's not the pressure, it's the flow. And, and in inducing more flow by restricting partially the interatrial communication so that we maintain a slightly higher left atrial pressure than the right atrial pressure by typically about three to four millimeters of mercury. This is the challenging part of this approach. Um, uh, that we are able to, to get more flow. We do add sometimes flow by a shunt uh, into the left pulmonary artery in patients who've had a glen uh, in an effort to try to augment the pulmonary blood flow and venous return into this left ventricle. We call this the super glen. And ultimately, the goal would be to convert these to biventricular repair. This is an example of a patient who started off with not too bad a ventricle, but certainly not based on, 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 the, on the sizes, not capable of supporting the systemic circulation. The RV surrounds the apex, so it's not a true apex um, uh, forming ventricle. And you can get these ventricles to, to grow substantially. This is our long-term results um, uh, so far with these patients. Um, we, this is, this is the, the, the hypoplast group. We've looked at this with other forms of um, uh, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, such as unbalanced canal, much more favorable for recruitment than, than this group. But in general, the results have been encouraging. We, we were able to, to maintain survival um, over a five-year period that's comparable to single ventricle management in these patients. Um, whether we do it as a recruitment or simply a conversion in patients who've had previous um, single ventricle palliation that, that whose ventricle for whatever reason uh, became uh, adequate, uh, we simply have converted them to, to biventricular repair without the re recruitment step. Uh, our results long-term are comparable. I'm gonna skip this in the interest of time and just to summarize that our approach to hypoplastic left heart syndrome management is twofold. One is we're trying to improve the, the efficiency of the single ventricle physiology um, and in, in a way that actually reduces the operative risk. And that's by choosing the method, primarily choosing the method for controlling pulmonary blood flow using the RV to PA conduit variants um, to, to improve the survival. And we're always continuing to look for forms or ways to recruit a chamber that is uh, usually not capable of supporting the systemic circulation. And I'll end there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Del Nido. Thanks a lot. I'm sure you will have some uh, space at the end. I know that probably you have to leave uh, after uh, this presentation. So thanks again. Uh, I'll be around for, for a bit, uh, but I'm happy to answer any, any questions. Um, thank, you. thank you very much. So now we go on and we go to the hybrid approach 
We have, as uh, Professor Delnido told us, one of the experts on uh, this uh, uh, type of approach for uh, hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And I would like to introduce uh, Professor Marga Lantowitz, who is, uh, will talk about the, his experience with hybrid approach. The question was is, uh, if it's uh, still a uh, uh, classic, it became a classic procedure, is it still a rock procedure or Gil Adif is a JETS procedure. So I hope that he will uh, explain to us. So Mark Galantowicz is the chief of cardiothoracic surgery in, uh, at the Nation uh, Children's Hospital in Columbus. So thank you, Mark, and uh, enjoy. Thank you, Sasha. Good morning, afternoon, and evening to everybody. I, I thank Gil and Sasha and the organizers uh, again for putting a very informative uh, can you see now? Mark, you're good. Yes. All right. Uh, it's not letting me move the slides. I think it's because you're sharing your Zoom window. If you unshare and then just select either your desktop or PowerPoint for sharing, it should be okay. So what would you like me to do? So when you go to share screen, select yeah. either the desktop that PowerPoint is in, or um, the, it might give you an option to just sharing the PowerPoint application and then go to full screen. If you do that, either one should work. I think the issue is you're trying to advance, but your taskbar on your Mac said Zoom at the top. So I think the cursor was reacting to Zoom. Do you see me moving slides now? Nope, you're not sharing. All right. One thing we're learning in the quarantine is that open heart surgery seems to be easier than Zoom slide sharing. So share, we were fine before. How about now? Nothing yet. I can't remote control right now until I have something shared, but then I could try to navigate after. All right. I am sharing my screen with you. Yep, I see your desktop, select PowerPoint. And slideshow that, and it should work. Now try to advance. There you Perfect. go. All right. Yeah, heart surgery is a little easier, I think. So uh, I wasn't sure what Cla Sasha was getting at with the title that he asked me to talk about. I'm not a musician, but I suspect it has to do about thoughts for an indication. So I'll talk about that. And then one thing uh, we'll talk about a little bit is the challenge, some of the challenges with comprehensive stage two. So again, the context of why uh, we and the group in Germany for sure really embarked on a vigorous uh, attempt of coming up with an alternative really had to do with the fact that the improvements uh, with the management of hypoplastic left heart syndrome through the traditional approaches seems to have plateaued and that potentially this hybrid approach would serve not as a replacement per se, but a paradigm shift, uh, a platform to try and come up with alternatives. Again, in uh, the congenital heart surgery data from the 90s showed um, one year survival in the 60% range with only about half of the children getting to the goal of a Fontan and that most of those challenges surrounded the first stage procedure and then 10 years later, um, the Pediatric Heart Network, which was only in 12 centers that were really expert at managing hypoplastic left heart syndrome, there was a lot of optimism 
that the results would be better. Um, but in fact, they're almost superimposable on the results that were reported a decade earlier by the Congenital Heart Surgeon Society. And then a decade after this, um, one of the centers that has spent decades focused on hypoplastic left heart syndrome at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia came to the conclusion that things have really plateaued. So I think as uh, Pedro had shared, uh, we as well felt that there is room for improvement and innovation and investigation. And that's just talking about survival. Um, there's a very important morbidity that has lifelong consequences for that patient, that family, that community, and our society as a whole. The management of hypoplastic left heart syndrome is by far and away the largest resource utilizer uh, and the most expensive care that we, that we do for children, especially in the United States. Um, and one of the hopes is that by using a hybrid approach or other novel approaches that we can reduce some of the resource utilization um, and some preliminary results from our center as well as Toronto has shown that there is some reduction in resource utilization with the hybrid approach. So shifting a little bit to thoughts on current indications, um, I think it's uh, clear that a hybrid stage one can be very effective as a bridge to recovery for children who were not prenatally diagnosed or late diagnosis, um, that it can salvage very poor hemodynamics uh, and allow uh, end organ improvement um, it can also be a way to stabilize a child that has other um, significant uh, congenital abnormalities, such as congenital diaphragmatic hernia or intestinal perforation. Um, it's a simple way to palliate the complex cardiac physiology to allow other procedures to be done. It, and it is a nice way also for uh, families who were unprepared for all of this in a uh, simple way to have time to decide how they want to proceed as well as the healthcare provider. Uh, there's many publications that support uh, hybrid as a bridge to recovery. It can also be used to just delay a traditional approach and this was really first championed by uh, the groups in Japan where PDA stenting uh, was not available so that they would use a branch pulmonary artery banding, maintain prostaglandin, um, and initially were using that all the way out to a traditional Glen, but then uh, they started using it to just bridge to a delayed Norwood and have found uh, improved results. This then led to several centers thinking of um, a, really a four-stage hybrid approach where they would do a modified hybrid stage one with branch pulmonary artery bands only, prostaglandin for six weeks, and basically try and pick a time that optimizes um, the brain maturation that is felt to be somewhat delayed in children with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, especially mitral atresia, aortic atresia, where their brain is uh, four to six weeks delayed. So it's more um, vulnerable to perturbations and hemodynamics, saturations, blood pressure, et cetera. And there also seems to be somewhat of a sweet spot of when you can take the bands off very easily and the branch pulmonary arteries return to their normal size, caliber, and quality. Um, then at the stage two, a traditional Norwood or Sano with the band removal, they seem to have a smoother post-operative period, less um, uh, uh, variability and uh, vulnerability of the pulmonary vasculatures with swing of hemodynamics and saturations. Uh, survival seems to be better, and this is uh, documented in, in Japan uh, by uh, national data. And then carry on after that with more traditional Glenn or Fontan. The, this is a very thoughtful approach, but it's adding now another surgery and, and it's yet to be determined if overall this will be better outcomes. 
Uh, hybrid certainly is an effective way to bridge to heart transplantation in those that that's deemed the most optimum treatment. And uh, the group in Giesen uh, really have used this as a very uh, effective way to bridge to two ventricle repair. Um, and some centers where they uh, feel they have suboptimal outcomes and diagnoses like uh, truncus uh, with interrupted aortic arch or some other uh, complex two ventricles, I've used it as a bridge to two ventricle repair, bringing the child to an older age where they may be, uh, have better outcomes. Um, and it also can be used um, for patients where you're trying to decide whether they can go to two ventricle repair or not. Certainly the most common use these days is in high risk patients where the either uh, national data or institutional data show that their outcomes with a particular type of high risk uh, components, whether it's prematurity or weight or uh, other elements um, that it can bridge successfully um, and be used in the high risk infants. Um, this has contributed to potentially improved outcomes with, stand, uh, with uh, traditional risk patients um, going, undergoing uh, Norwoods or Sanos, but then what happens to those patients that have been bridged as a high risk uh, we'll talk about a little bit later. And then uh, it can also be used uh, for standard risk patients, which has become um, uh, the primary strategy taken here at Nationwide Children's Hospital, as well as the hospital in Giesen. Our experience at Nationwide now includes over 250 hybrid stage ones. We've taken nearly 200 of those through their second stage uh, operation and 112 of those have undergone a Fontan after an initial hybrid stage one. Our uh, overall long-term uh, outcomes are 78% uh, survival in standard risk patients out to 12 years, 65% um, overall survival in all patients, which include uh, those that are deemed high risk by the traditional definitions. Um, and we have not used it very much as a bridge to two ventricle uh, compared to the experience in Giesen. We've had the pleasure of having an over 20 year, very close collaboration with the group in Giesen um, and very similar total uh, experience in terms of numbers of patients, types of patients and long-term outcomes. So at least two groups have shown that it can be used with at least equivalent uh, outcomes to traditional approaches. But again, um, I think this is just not meant to be a replacement. Uh, it's meant to be a platform for improvement. And my fantasy when we got into this a long time ago was really that this would be a tool in the toolbox and as we start to understand that this is a syndrome of multiple different forms of hypoplastic left heart syndrome, we may better align various therapies and various, surgi and various surgical strategies um, to the various types of hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And I think uh, the work at Boston Children is uh, going to be one of the things I wanted to uh, touch base on uh, has to do with the comprehensive stage two, because the uh, nationally and it seems globally that there is now clearly a role for the hybrid stage one. It's, it's a quite simple procedure to do. The problem is then there, there needs to be a commitment um, on how you manage them in the interstage period to make them successful for the su subsequent comprehensive stage two. And this is a very close collaboration between interventional cardiology and surgery. Um, and it takes uh, experience and a skill set that over time um, uh, allows you to learn and improve. Um, the second operation includes all components that any busy congenital heart program is used to, but it's, it's put together in a different way 
um, and getting optimum outcomes has been a, its own learning experience from the learning experience of the hybrid stage one. This is the, a listing in the last page of the STAT categories and the comprehensive stage two is nearly the most complex or highest risk operation that is categorized. Um, it continues to carry some of the highest um, mortality of everything that's categorized in the STS database. Um, and part of the reason and one of the big areas has to do with what's going on here between the ductal arch, the left pulmonary artery and the left bronchus. One of the things that is uniform after bilateral pulmonary artery bands and a PDA stent is this area of the main pulmonary artery is somewhat dilated and certainly much more dilated than the branch pulmonary arteries. How this gets reconstructed is very important. And it turns out that it's so important that uh, we've gone to always doing a completion angiogram at the end of the operation, because this is what you want to see. You want to see completely unobstructed flow um, into uh, unobstructed or unstenotic branch pulmonary arteries. And often, Visually, we think our branch pulmonary arteries look that way, but here's a completion angiogram that shows a stenosis here, which turns out to be a fold. Um, and sometimes behind the reconstructed ductal arch, you can't tell that you're either creating compression or twist or fold. So it's very important to identify that. It's very easy to treat. Uh, by intraoperative stenting. At this point, we've learned that the left pulmonary artery and a high percentage of patients wind up at some point getting a left pulmonary artery stent. Um, and so we've gone to preemptively stenting that at the time of the comprehensive stage two. This is very easy to do, to do with the left pulmonary, the, the confluence of the pulmonary arteries open. Under direct visualization, you can see the left upper lobe and you can place the stent exactly where you want it. And that way you can have it in position so that it's not crossing any of the upper lobe or lower lobe. Um, and you have a completion angiogram that confirms that you have unobstructed flow. We've been doing this for three years now and have had no instant stenoses. This type of stent is easily dilatable to normal adult size. Um, and many of these strategies has allowed this, although it's a very big operation, for these children to behave as if they were having a traditional Glen, uh, as opposed to having uh, more of a complex uh, recovery. When we uh, went through this learning phase and added all these steps, we nicely were able to reduce the risk of this operation uh, down to now less than 4% mortality. The challenge is though, if you look at uh, all centers reporting uh, results with comprehensive stage two, at least in the United States, there's a huge discrepancy in frequency with which it's done. The majority of the centers are doing one or two. This is over the course of five years. Um, and so the frequency of centers doing a comprehensive stage two is very, very low, which makes one wonder um, whether they're able to get over the learning curve that is necessary to have reduced uh, mortality. So I think it's a little bit of a challenge when you uh, are using the hybrid approach. Um, and if you use it for high risk patients, yes, that helps the outcomes for a traditional approach, but then you may not have enough experience with how to manage them between the one and the two and then at the comprehensive stage two. And so a center could find themselves continuously or perpetually in the learning curve with suboptimal outcomes for those particular patients. Uh, I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much. Uh
Thank you very much, Mark. It's a pleasure to see you. So we have the lower front now. We want to try to start one poll. Gil, what do you think? Yeah, I think that would be fantastic. Also, I just want to mention because of technological issues, uh, we're going over our time. Uh, we hope to be able to catch that up quickly. We'll ask all the speakers to stay on time and hopefully the audience will be able to stay past uh, the top of the hour next hour. Okay, but if Lowell's ready, Lowell, if you're ready to share the screen, go ahead. I am, thank you. Um, thanks, Sasha, thanks, Gil. Great, so um, I wanna welcome everybody, regardless of your time of day. This is really exciting and certainly is one of the silver linings to come out of the global pandemic. I'm gonna speak very briefly and then we're gonna get a little information from you guys in attendance today. So my role here in moderator, as moderator is that I'm the president of the Society of Pediatric Cardiology Training Program Directors. We are currently a US-based organization representing the 63 accredited pediatric cardiology fellowship training programs. You can see a map of the continental United States on your screen and these are where our member programs Um, this is our board. Um, I'm the president. Lori Armsby from Oregon Health and Science University is our vice president. Susan Etheridge at a primary children's hospital in Salt Lake City, Utah is our secretary and treasurer. And David Brown from Boston Children's Hospital is our past president. And we have both coasts of the U.S. represented in our membership. Um, and we meet in person, usually, at the American Academy of Pediatrics, as well as at the American College of Cardiology, Obviously, our in-person meetings have uh, been impacted significantly, although we have found ourselves meeting more regularly, and it's really been a wonderful community as we've been working to maintain the quality of pediatric cardiology education for our fellows. There have been a number of, initi of initiatives that the society has worked on. We've done standardized evaluation. We've looked at the American workforce. We've done training guidelines for fellowship programs, and we've certainly partnered with other organizations in the US, the ACGME and the American Board of Pediatrics to come up with entrustable professional activities. One of the things that has really become clear in my mind during our current crisis is that in some ways we've had a very narrow focus in that we've really just been focusing on US education. And uh, one of the things we would definitely like to do going forward is partner with international pediatric cardiology educators and see where we can collaborate, where we can learn from each other and how we can further pediatric cardiology care across the globe. So to that end, um, I'm gonna grab a pen or a pencil. I want you to write down two things. One, in reverse order, is my email address. It's lfrank at childrensnational.org. Um, if you are a cardiology educator and you'd like to collaborate, especially if you run a training program, we'd love to speak with you and see how we can work together. Our group is doing twice weekly educational sessions targeted at cardiology fellows, and there may be ways we can share that content. And importantly, as an educator, uh, we cannot offer a teaching session without asking for feedback. It's in our DNA. So you can see that there's a short URL on your screen. It's bit.ly backslash HLHS evaluation. So just take a moment and write that down. At the end of today's session, We'd ask that you complete an evaluation on today's masterclass. It's very brief. It'll take you 60 seconds or less, 90 seconds if you give us some qualitative comments. Um, and the last thing I'm going to do is get a little information from you. So I'm going to stop my screen. We're going to go back to the gallery view. And you're going to see a little bit of demographic information come up on your screen. So I'd ask you to take a couple seconds. Tell us a little about yourself. So our first question is, what's your background? I'm gonna leave this up for about 20 seconds. About 30, 45% of our attendees have voted. Please try to get those answers in so we can get on schedule. No. All right, I'm gonna share these results. So you can see that 
about half the attendants today are uh, cardiologists, a fair number of cardiac intensivists and surgeons, as well as representation for trainees, nurses, et cetera. Okay, our next question, and I really hope this helps create a real sense of global community. Tell us where you're from, or actually where you live currently, not where you're from, sorry, where are you currently located? You guys are getting quicker at voting and I appreciate it. All right, I'm gonna share this. This should be statistically significant. So welcome to our colleagues in Latin America and the Caribbean. You are the plurality of our attendees today, as well as a lot of uh, Eastern United States, probably due to time zones, no doubt. And our European colleagues, and you scroll to the bottom, we have representation really from all over the world. This is, this is really wonderful. Next question. What's your involvement in patients with hypoplastic left heart syndrome? How many patients have you cared for per year? Okay, I'm gonna share those results now. So most people in attendance today, are really the answers go across the board. Some people are caring for more than 20, but the plurality is caring for three to five over the course of the year. Okay, next question. What is the treatment of choice in your center? All right, we have about two thirds of the participants who have voted. I'll give that another few seconds. And here we go. Despite Dr. Galanowitz's description of the hypoplastic left heart syndrome toolbox, there is one tool that seems to be used more than others. So the Norwood Sano is the, major is the treatment of choice in the majority of cases here. And then interestingly, a classic Norwood and some variation of a hybrid are used about equally amongst our attendees today. Okay, now, uh, last question for which there is not a right answer. What is the best age for second stage in your center? And after this, I believe Professor Anderson is still on the line and I'm gonna launch your questions and you can, um, as we would say in US medical schools, pimp the audience. All right, I'm gonna share those results. They're pretty overwhelming. So two thirds of our attendees would perform a second stage at four to six months of age. Some a little later, some a little earlier. Okay, now we have um, two questions that were graciously prepared by Professor Anderson. So I'm gonna unmute him and I will launch those on the screen. Professor Anderson, you're uh, good to go if you want to take the audience through these. Well, can we see the results? Well, I'm interesting to know how well they were interesting to what I presented to them and whether they sure. agree with me or not. Do you have the- Sure. They are, um, so to the audience, you guys can vote now. We won't read it. So we're asking for which of these is true? We want to know which is true, absolutely. Can more than one answer, Dr. Anderson? Oh, correct, correct. Several of them can be true. So we want to know, that, again, I haven't phrased it. Uh, we have to have some other way of uh, setting the questions. I've, I'm screwing up again with the way I'm posing the questions. Well, I think uh, medical education has ingrained in us that when you have five choices in front of you, you are only allowed to pick one. 
I'm so well people... out of date, I regret to say. I was that multiple choice was a new thing when they retired me. So uh, <laughs> I didn't realize we had only one to choose from. I think but, if we did oral boards for a session of a thousand people, um, it might be a little catastrophic. So okay. about 40% um, of the attendees have voted. I'm going to end this now. Um, but uh, President, if you want to take us through. So 74% picked that A was true, although All there's right. large trues for B. We can't see it, Low. Oh, sorry. There you go. So three quarters said A was true, half said B was true, and just under half said D was true, understanding that there may have been some um, issues so with how fact, people interpreted so that. In fact, if I take you through them, the, the, uh, the ones that are false are C, because I tried to persuade you that there was a relationship between the size of the left ventricle and the ascending aorta. The other one that is false is E, of course, because uh, not all the uh, patients are destined for functional univentricular palliation if we agree that the complex is part of the hyperplastic left heart syndrome. And I now think it is the best end of the spectrum. And I think that in those selected patients, you can go directly for a biventricular repair. And also, as uh, Pedro showed very beautifully in his presentation, I thought Pedro's presentation very nicely reinforced what I was saying, that it is a spectrum of disease, it is a disease of fetal life, and that the specific treatment should be tailored to the subsets within the spectrum. Excellent. And now, um, with the warning to the audience that this next question actually is set up correctly, you can pick more than one answer. Please select all of the following that are true. So the answers are rolling in now. This does take a little more time, obviously, because you have to read all the answers. Oh, do you want me to read? Do you want me to take them through them as we as it's up on the screen? Uh, why don't we wait another twenty seconds or so? Because about twelve percent of the audience has voted. I see them as it comes in, and um, as soon as I share it, people can't vote. So we'll let them vote a little bit. I think what we have to do, if we ever do this again, Lowell, is you and I have to discuss how I should phrase the questions. Oh, I think you phrased it fine. It was set up correctly. We just need to prime the audience. All right, when we cross that right now, we've had about half of the audience vote. I would again say that this is probably statistically significant. So we can continue on with the excellent presentations. I'm going to end this, share it. And Professor Anderson, if you want to take us through this. So coarctation lesions are in fact common. Probably more than half of the patients with hyperplastic left heart syndrome have a coarctation lesion. And for sure, when you have the coarctation lesion, it is an extent of the ductal tissue. And what I hope I showed you in the specimens was that when you have that, it can also involve the left subclavian artery. It is not true that the oval foramen always remains patent. What I try to emphasize was integrity of the oval fossa was a risk factor. And that uh, this is uh, particularly the case, the findings in terms of mitral atresia do, do suggest that at some time there was a patent left atrioventricular valve. And this again goes along with what Pedro said. I think all the evidence shows that whatever is causing hyperplastic left heart syndrome, and for sure there are genetic predispositions, but it happens after the heart has completed its normal formation in terms of the atrioventricular ventricular arterial connections, and then something happens to stop the left ventricle growing. As yet, we don't know what it is, but our efforts to determine this, we should be looking for what it is that stops the left ventricle growing, and of course, looking equally well for the genetic predispositions, but as yet, we have nothing from mouse models that are pointing us in the appropriate direction. Excellent, thank you. So once again, you guys can see my screen. Um, please write down the link, it's bit.ly backslash HLHS evaluation. If you have to leave early, please feel free to complete it. 
Otherwise, just wait to the end of the session. It is very brief and the feedback is incredibly valuable. So we can continue to help co-sponsor these sessions and make them worthwhile for you. And again, if you're a pediatric cardiology educator, especially if you run a training program, please feel free to reach out to me and we would love to collaborate with our colleagues across the world. With that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Sasha, who will introduce our next speakers. It, it's up to you. I think it's me. Lowell, thanks for doing that. Um, on the bit.ly link, you must, you must put HTTPS backslash backs, colon backsplash backsplash. We have about an hour and a half of scheduled, like about an hour and 20 minutes of scheduled lecture. We went on with a very ambitious program and we've had a little difficulties with time. Uh, we have a couple of things in our back pocket that we can sort of try to keep this to about 30 minutes past the hour. And I'm happy to introduce the chair of pediatric cardiology in Linz, Austria, Dr. Daryl Tolzer, who will be jumping right in with fetal interventions. Gerald, if you can share your screen, that would be yes. terrific. Great. Thank you. So, can you see the screen? Yes, yeah. we can see it. Yes, okay. Okay, fetal interventions. Well, as Professor Anderson said, uh, it's an acquired disease during uh, fetal life, but critically aortic stenosis that's uh, feasible for an uh, uh, fetal intervention has, of course, different uh, appearances. I'll just show you a couple of pictures of hugely dilated left ventricles at uh, second trimester fetuses, where you can see this blown up left ventricle in mitral stenosis and aortic stenosis. Um, it can lead to high drops if the left ventricle compresses the right ventricle and cardiac output is decreased. There can be all sizes of uh, left ventricles that can be associated with severe mitral regurgitation, as you can see here, with huge left atrium, giant left atrium, and of course, closed foramen, or a severely restrictive foramen, ovale as well. And Professor Pedro Lido already showed these pictures where uh, almost adequate size left ventricle can evolve into hypoplastic left heart syndrome within a couple of weeks. So the goals of a fetal intervention would be to ensure or improve survival in cases where fetal congestive heart failure has developed and high drops has developed. You want to achieve a biventricular versus a univentricular repair after birth. Uh, it should improve cardiac function, it should improve fetal hemodynamics, and of course, improve long-term outcome as well. Well, so the chances of a fetal cardiac intervention in critical aortic stenosis is uh, really life-saving if you have severe high drops or if it's an evolving hypoblastic left heart syndrome to rescue the left ventricle for a postnatal biventricular circulation. Of course, on the other hand, there are certain risks. Of course, the procedure-related procedure, uh, procedure -related death. You have bradycardia, you have bleeding that uh, necessitates treatment. You have premature rupture of the membrane, premature labor and infection risks, of course, and of course, all kind of maternal risks so far. It's just to, to show you how this intervention is done here in a fetus in a very nice position. So the left ventricle here is punctured at a certain angle because most of the time the left ventricle output is not straight in line with centricular receptor but has a clear angle. So the needle is advanced just beneath the aortic valve as you can see here. And from that you will uh, advance the a wire and the balloon catheter across the valve. So here's the region of the aortic valve. You can see now the balloon is blown up. Uh, it's usually we, we try to make small movements to be sure that when the balloon is out of the needle and in the correct uh, place. And after the procedure, everything is pulled out in one piece, hopefully. And in this case, we haven't got any bradycardia, we haven't got any pericardial effusion at all. Now, when the color comes up, you see blue color out of the left ventricle into the ascending order and a significant amount of aortic regurgitation, which we really want to see because you have turned the aortic valve. Just to give you an example, in this 24 weeks fetus that showed up with severe mitral regurgitation, high drops, reversed flow in the aortic arch, just uh, four weeks after the procedure, you had a markedly larger right ventricle smaller left atrium, you could see the mitral regurgitation has very much 
improved and the flow in the aortic arch has reversed from retrograde to anti-grade flow. And this was the uh, echo after uh, at the age of uh, eight months. Now the child is almost three years of age and hasn't need any uh, postnatal intervention so far, nor a cardiac cath, nor aortic volume violation, and no surgery at all. So in this case, it was a tree leaflet, a tree leaflet aortic valve. We got a very good result after an almost desperate situation of 24 weeks with fetal high drops and congestive heart failure. Uh, e evolving hypoplastic left heart syndrome is characterized by this dilated, poorly contracting left ventricle most of the time with endocardial fibroelastosis with a reversed flow in the aortic arch, as you can see nicely here in this fetal echo and left to right shunt across the foramen ovale. The question always is, is it a salvageable left ventricle? Does it really make sense to intervene here or is it already too late? And the criteria definitely is the size of the left ventricle at a certain gestational age, the long axis usually, and also the left ventricular pressure it can be estimated usually by the presence of a mitral regurgitation. Here in Linz, we, all, we look at the gestational age and we want to have an 18 millimeter LV at 22, 24 weeks mm -hmm. and up to 20 millimeters at 28 to 32 weeks. So the smaller, so the younger the fetus, the larger the left ventricle really has to be. And this is another example at 22 plus four weeks and shows the natural progression within five weeks to a dilated cardiomyopathy here and endocardial fibroelastosis, almost no more filling of the LV. Three weeks after the intervention, the left ventricle is basically back to a normal size and function and the filling also has improved a lot. Of course, the myocardial response prenatally is different from the myocardial response postnatally and this may have some important Implications so growth of the left ventricle really should be maybe a little bit different and more favorable than uh, in postnatal session. The, the few cases that we followed at our center longitudinally showed that we could achieve some uh, left ventricular growth, as you can see here on the left side uh, of the um, uh, figure, but on the right side, you see that the set score is decreasing. That means the left ventricle they grow, but they grow at a lower rate. So they need a certain size at the beginning to be able to uh, be suitable for a biventricular outcome. What about the results? Of course, the largest program is from Boston Children's Hospital. They published in 2009 the results and they had about 29% of successful procedures for a biventricular outcome. But then they introduced the score, basically about the size of the left ventricle, the size of mitral and the aortic valve, and the pressure of the LV. And if the score is favorable, you can push this uh, result up to 50%, 50%. Recently, they published about 101 technically successful procedures, and they increased the biventricular outcome up to about 60% now, especially if you have a good LV pressure, it's a good sign. Uh, our uh, experience here at the uh, Children's Heart Center in Linz. Now we've done 180 procedures, about 160 neurotic valve procedures. As you can see here um, up to today, the last analysis we did was late 2019 of 92 neurotic valve procedures, 77 fetuses. We had a procedure related death rate now at around four to five percent. As you can see, uh, the 60 successfully treated live-born patients were born all over Europe, about 27 in our center and 33 in other different centers in Europe. We had four neonatal deaths, so uh, 42 neonates that were treated towards a biventricular circulation. It's about 73%. Uh, if you look after 28 days, so after the neonatal period, we still have a biventricular rate from about 73%, and after one year, of about 68% but it's always the problem that you have no control group in these um, patients. So we compared our results to, our, to the large natural history study we did at the APC meeting. Out of 107 cases of fetal aortic stenosis, we found about 35 cases that fulfilled the criteria of evolving hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So a natural history co-wrote about 28% became biventricular without any intervention. And this was compared to our group, the 51 uh, cases that 
uh, we got a biventricular rate of about 68. So this was statistically significant, but of course, it is a retrospective comparison with all the problems and uh, and uh, so a prospective study really would be needed. And this is now to be started in at the, from the APC to look at the prospective way with a prospective control group. Just a few examples from fetal life uh, up to uh, uh, an angiogram at two years of age it means that this left ventricle have the potential to recover nicely. This kid got a Roscona surgery right after uh, birth. Another example from a uh, dilated cardiomyopathy of pretty stenosis to a nice result at two years of age. So the risks are, we say, the procedure rated deaths now are between four to five percent. Bradycardia with treatment we needed in about 30 percent. Pericardial effusions in 10 percent. We had no premature rupture of the membranes, infections, or premature labor. And the maternal risks are also, uh, besides nausea and pain, without any major problems. The aortic regurgitation, as you can see here, is quite significant after the procedure, but usually it disappears or improves dramatically until uh, birth. Severe mitral regurgitation improves uh, by itself if the pressure is down. You can see here 28 weeks, one week after intervention, and the neonate has almost no more um, mitral regurgitation here. So the fetal intervention is, I think, uh, absolutely uh, a good therapy to consider in a small subset of fetuses. It's all about patient selection, and it still is a small step in a very complex uh, management procedure of these patients. You need a further pregnancy and fetal management, delivery management, neonatal management, surgical intervention management, intensive care, and a very good follow-up, including the neurodevelopment uh, again. So this is definitely something that it's good for centralization to gain enough experience and to, uh, to carry out. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gerald. That's uh, fantastic work that you're doing in LINS. And uh, we look forward to seeing some more of the results that come through. Uh, and I appreciate those beautiful images. Um, it's really my pleasure to introduce yeah. a friend and uh, colleague here at Children's National, uh, Dr. Mary D'Onofrio, who's the director of the Fetal Heart Program here. Uh, she also is uh, the co-director of the Cardiac Neurodevelopmental Outcomes uh, Clinic that we have. So she spans both the prenatal and late postnatal life. She's become uh, known as an international expert in this field, and it was hard to pick a topic that she could speak on uh, for just uh, you know 10 or 15 minutes because there are so many things that she's expert in. But what she has chosen to speak about is two particular areas uh, that she has focused on, the brain development uh, in the fetus with congenital heart disease and how to improve uh, the outcomes based on how to deliver these babies. So I'm pleased to introduce uh, Dr. D'Onofrio. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Gil, and thanks to the organizers for having me. Can you hear me? Good, Mary. Cool, and you can see my slides, I assume. Uh, we can. They're a bit blurry. Um, uh, do you have a lot of videos? Uh, just a couple. Um, if the videos are critical, keep going. If not, unshare and don't do that checkbox, I told you. Okay. <laughs> Let's see if I can find that checkbox now. Again, one, while Dr. D'Onofrio is working on that, one of the things that we're learning is with a meeting with a thousand participants, the availability of bandwidth uh, is very challenging. Uh, and we'll be getting these fixed as we move forward. Thanks, Mary. Perfect, Mary. Beautiful. Okay, great. So for my 10 minutes, I am going to touch on the circulatory changes that impact in utero brain development and create the potential for injury and hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And I do think the Time Magazine cover um, really is true that the first nine months uh, do shape the rest of your life. Uh, and then we'll highlight briefly strategies for management that may improve neurodevelopmental outcome in babies diagnosed in utero. 
So for those of us who think about neurodevelopmental outcome and congenital heart disease and try to understand how we get from fetus to a kid who can enter school and do well, there's obviously a continuum of injury that really starts even before you're born and then continues uh, through the pre-perioperative and post-operative period and then long term. And what we're realizing is that this time point here uh, in fetal life and in during transition to neonate is very important. Uh, so when we think about hypoplastic left heart in utero, um, if you look at this cartoon here, uh, the circulation is such that the placental blood enters the right ventricle, mixes with the venous return just like postnatally, and that blood crosses the main PA, the ductus, and then supplies the brain in a retrograde fashion through a very tiny vessel uh, to get to the cerebral uh, circulation. Uh, the easiest way to look at uh, cerebral blood flow in utero is simply with Doppler ultrasound. And if you put uh, color Doppler uh, right on top of the head in the fetus, you can easily see the circle of Willis. Um, normal flow uh, is high resistance, which is the first uh, Doppler slide uh, with a low diastolic flow. And what the obstetricians tell us is that if there is uh, any kind of compromise or cerebral hypoxemia, there is increased diastolic flow due to decreased resistance. Way back in 2003, um, I put together a multi-center prospective study just to simply ask the question if cerebral blood flow was abnormal in our patients with congenital heart disease. And surprisingly, we found that it was uh, overall and then if you look specifically at um, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, two thirds of those fetuses had abnormalities in cerebral blood flow at some point in gestation. Uh, since then, uh, multiple investigators have kind of confirmed that and now we've really moved on to more advanced imaging, including fetal brain MRI. Uh, and one of the leaders in the field is actually my colleague, Dr. Limperopoulos, who's with us now at Children's. Uh, this initial landmark study that uh, was published in circulation revealed to us that using 3D brain uh, analysis in the fetus, brain growth was actually slower in those with congenital heart disease, that's the blue open circles, compared to normal, which is the red diamonds. And it seemed to happen in the third trimester where brain growth fell off. And then using MR spectroscopy, um, looking at chemicals in the brain that assess neuroaxonal development, Again, what she found was that in the third trimester, it's here, these uh, blue uh, circles, um, that again, neuroaxonal development fell off compared to normal. Interestingly, relating that to the type of congenital heart disease, brain volumes were more likely to be decreased in those heart defects with decreased aortic flow. So any of the left-sided obstructive lesions, including hypoplastic left heart, and neuroaxonal development was decreased in heart disease with absent anti-grade aortic flow, so those with aortic atresia, as well as those with elevated cerebral lactate, suggesting that even in utero, not enough oxygen and nutrients is making it to the brain. Uh, in a follow-up study uh, of just hypoplastic left heart uh, group, um, what was found was less gyrification, less cortical plate surface area in those with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, and a progressive decrease in um, cortical white and gray matter, again, occurring in the third trimester. Also, using higher uh, level imaging delays in development of the local sulci and gyri. Uh, and then what was noted, again, uh, fetuses that had no anti-grade aortic flow, so this is the aortic atresia group, as well as these abnormalities in cerebral blood flow were more likely to show these uh, abnormalities in uh, gray and white matter and cortical surface area. So what do we know about brain injury um, before surgery? Well, there's many, many studies out there that suggest that brain injury does occur prior to surgery and it's up to 53% uh, in some studies. The injury that can Occur include infarction and stroke, periventricular leukomalacia, white matter injury, interventricular hemorrhage, and if you use MR spectroscopy, lactate. Postoperative findings tend to be similar, though certainly worse. Uh, in our uh, center, um, we asked the question of when does this happen, and we're able to compare fetal brain MRI 
to the preoperative brain MRI study in 100, over 100 patients with congenital heart disease, we did find abnormalities in fetal MRI, um, but more often there were abnormalities in the postnatal MRI in about a third of them with new postnatal findings in 24, um, so that is almost a quarter. And if you look at this table here, um, the ones that started out normal and then went on to have injury or some findings was most likely to be due to some sort of injury. Specifically, hypoplastic left heart syndrome was a large number of those patients. Uh, and uh, the data showed that 17% had abnormalities on fetal study, and uh, a third of the, almost a third, 27%, had abnormalities on the pre-op MRI. So something is happening either in the delivery room or in those first days of life before surgery. So we've been thinking about this for, I've been thinking about this for a very long time, and when I got to Children's in 2004, I thought we could really do better. What can we do to minimize birth trauma can we even predict those fetuses who are going to be compromised uh, in the delivery room in the first hours of life? And we put together this protocol, which we call our level of care protocol, which predicts transitional physiology and the level of care needed um, by using specific fetal echo findings. It's been published, uh, uh, our results, in a prospective uh, manner of using this, and it has become part of the AHA scientific statement for fetal cardiology uh, care. So when you look at hypoplastic left heart syndrome uh, in utero, you can see in these pictures that the left ventricle is small. Uh, and the, this uh, screen over here on the right, which shows the aortic arch, the red is the reverse flow in that tiny transverse arch from the ductus. So obviously this is a ductal dependent lesion. Most of these kids will do okay in the delivery room and maybe in the first hour of life, as long as the transport happens quickly and we educate the neonatologist um, of what to do. Um, that's a level two patient um, where we prepare for a really a more rapid transport uh, after initiation of prostaglandin. But in uh, about 10% of uh, patients with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, and I apologize this is paying so slowly, the additional concern is the atrial septum. Uh, is it adequate for left atrial egress uh, and return of that pulmonary venous blood into the circulation? Uh, and if that septum is tight, then what we know we need to do is go from the delivery room to the catheterization lab to open up that atrial septum and restore the circulation. Uh, and then this becomes a level four with a lot of planning to facilitate that rapid transport to the cath lab. How do we figure this out? We use pulmonary vein Doppler, uh, and it's the bottom Doppler pattern with really just back and forth flow that suggests we're going to need to intervene. Um, what more can we do? Well, we use maternal hyperoxia testing to simulate postnatal delivery room physiology. For those of you who don't know, if you give a pregnant lady oxygen in the third trimester, it will decrease the fetal pulmonary vascular resistance and increase pulmonary blood flow. Uh, and in a pilot study, we were able to show that it is useful in uh, varying different congenital heart disease diagnoses. We had four with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And actually, in three of them, we were encouraged that the uh, egress of left uh, pulmonary venous blood was actually adequate and really were then able to assign them a level two, initiate prostaglandin, uh, and transfer to our unit. There was one, however, that uh, had an intact septum and a vertical vein that really um, we were able to show that that vertical vein, that decompressing vein was inadequate. And for this baby, we um, up the sort of care pathway to include a C-section in our cardiac OR and then went on to do an immediate septoplasty. Another use of maternal hyperoxia testing is actually to assess the pulmonary vascular bed. And this study that came out of Philadelphia a while ago now was able to show in hypoplastic left heart syndrome that there is variability. If the atrial septum is open, there seems to be reactivity of that pulmonary bed. If the atrial septum is concerning, there is less often reactivity. And in the group in which the pulmonary bed was not reactive to oxygen, again, this is in utero, 
that had a very high sensitivity for postnatal need for uh, intervention soon after birth to open up the atrial septum. So what we know uh, is that the fetal brain has delayed development in utero in hypoplastic left heart syndrome, and this premature brain uh, is vulnerable and likely more susceptible to injury from hypoxia and cyanosis and decreased perfusion that comes with the disease and obviously ultimately the effects of cardiopulmonary bypass that are needed for palliation. So the question is, what can we do uh, to change this in utero, in the delivery room, during transition, uh, and in the ICU? So one of the things that has come up is, can we give oxygen in a chronic way uh, to moms uh, who are carrying babies with hypoplastic left heart syndrome and maybe promote brain development. Uh, it, from this study in Philadelphia, this was the use of oxygen in the short term um, for 15 minutes, and they were able to show at baseline uh, cerebral blood flow was abnormal. And just with a uh, brief initiation of oxygen, um, the pulsatility index changed and became more normal. So that suggests that that oxygen is getting to the brain. Now, what they also showed that it seemed to be gestational age dependent and the vascular bed in the brain was not reactive until the third trimester. So a simple question is, can we improve postnatal uh, or preoperative conditions? Uh, this is one study that says, yes, we can. Um, prenatally diagnosed uh, hypoplastic lefts were less acidotic, um, less multi-organ dysfunction, less likely to be intubated and have ventilation times. This is our work in the group that had, were the high risk class with the restrictive or intact atrial septum, where we put a plan in place to go straight to the cath lab. Obviously, we, our time to care and time to intervention were shorter, but we also had a better um, PO2 such that our lowest oxygen level wasn't quite as bad. And lastly, this study out of up as it affects the brain, uh, looked at uh, and was able to show in complex patients that brain injury in those with a prenatal diagnosis. And in the hypoplast, it was 23% versus 53%. Uh, and there was more rapid brain development, so the benefit persisted uh, even after surgery. Finally, delivery timing. We get to pick the delivery. We've learned that delivery before 38 weeks is associated with more post-op complications, longer length of stay, and increased mortality. The sweet spot seems to be after 39 weeks for the delivery. That also impacts neurodevelopment. Uh, in these few studies, it's adolescents, those born early, have increased risk of executive dysfunction, more ADHD, and greater psychiatric symptoms. And finally, this work from Philadelphia, um, the longer the time to surgery, is associated with um, lower cerebral oxygen saturation and greater volumes of brain injury. And believe it or not, when we pick the data delivery, uh, deliver, that actually does impact the time to surgery. And it seems as if Wednesday is the worst day of the week to be born. Uh, so with that, I will end. Children with heart disease certainly are at risk of neurodevelopmental disabilities due to brain, altered brain development that starts in utero um, brain injury does happen in utero, however, there's ongoing risk, uh, and prenatal diagnosis does give us the opportunity to modify care. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mary. It was a pleasure to hear from you. We go fast uh, to the next, uh, uh, the part four of the meeting, and uh, I will ask uh, Dr. Elio Caruso, who is uh, there, if he can open the the microphone and introduce uh, Professor uh, Silverman. Yes. So, um, good morning, good afternoon, colleague. Um, dear colleague, uh, today for me is a great, uh, great day uh, because it's a great pleasure to stay here with you. Uh, actually, I'm working um, as a pediatric cardiologist uh, with Dr. Sasha Agati at Mediterranean Pediatric Center in Taormina. And I work uh, with him for Congenital Art Academy. And so I'm very uh, glad for uh, this op opportunity. And uh, I want, I, for me, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Norman Silverman. Uh, he was uh, my mentor, and he is actually my mentor for fetal scan and for echo in pediatric patients. 
I, I did um, a long train with him at um, Stanford University Lucy Pagar uh, Hospital. And so um, for me, it's a pleasure to uh, stay with, uh, with you and uh, with a um, uh, great meeting. And so um, thanks, Norman, for all. Um, so um, what about the, uh, is necessary in non-invasive imaging in uh, 2020? Thank you, Norman. Thank you very much, uh, Elio. I'm just trying to find my um, my screen, which is is on here. Uh, there it is. Uh, I think it's that one. Um, I need some help. <laughs> I'm sharing my screen. With me, am I uh, am I on Lowell? Lover, Lover, are you there? Yeah, sorry. When um, yes, when the other co-host muted everybody, we inadvertently la, muted. La, la. Norman, I think you're fine now. Um, I okay. can see your Zoom screen, so pull your PowerPoint into the desktop you're sharing. It is. Uh, do you have a second monitor? No, I don't. Uh, yes, I do. Yes, yeah, so oh. you're sharing the other one. So um, I'm going to stop your sharing. Start sharing again, and just select. You'll have a a big checker box. Uh, menu of which you want to share and just make sure you share the desktop that has PowerPoint active in it. Um, oh, I know I'm stuck. Now. Here we go. So share the screen. Here we go. <clears throat> and then select whichever monitor has PowerPoint active in it, whether it's desktop one or desktop two. Here Perfect. We go. Okay. Wonderful. So, um, I want to thank uh, you, Lowell, as well as um, uh, Sasha and Gil for uh, having me uh, contribute to this very esteemed uh, meeting that you guys are putting on. I also have a declaration disclosure that I will be using uh, morphological comparisons to the echocardiograms. Uh, these from Bob Anderson and Diane Spicer, as you've already seen from our upcoming publication in www.md1world.com. Now, as far as the echocardiographic directive in hyperplastic left heart, there are, uh, as the Professor Anderson said, the phenotypic feature of the syndrome is the presence of concordant AV and VA connections. I just want to try and get rid of the pin video. There we go. Uh, in this presentation, I will be uh, looking at uh, echocardiography and its critical value in establishing the diagnosis, the type of abnormality, and associated lesions. We begin with mitral atresia, and here is an example of mitral atresia, where uh, uh, the uh, echo shows a virtual, the pathology shows a virtual uh, left ventricle, no actual uh, mitral valve is present. And on echocardiogram, this is what is generally seen. Uh, a large right heart, a small left atrium, and no other ventricular uh, mass noted other than the right ventricle. And the, the color flow will show you the importance of this by uh, adding the additional presence of uh, tricuspid regurgitation, an important prognostic feature in this condition. Professor Anderson already showed this picture of a, a restricted mitral valve present with almost atresia, with endocardial fibroelastosis present because of the presence of the mitral valve, and also showed these ventricular coronary connections, which he correctly pointed out, uh, were present in a large percentage of patients with the hyperplastic left heart syndrome. And when you look at the echocardiogram, you can see that the mitral valve is not opening, although it is present. And there's also the addition of endocardial fibroblastosis, not to the same extent yeah. as the yeah. specimen yeah. that we see here. So that we would call an imperforate valve. More usual situation in hyperplastic left heart is this situation. Oh, I've drawn uh, as arrows here the position of the ventricular septum to show that the right ventricle is apex forming in this condition. 
as it is on the echocardiogram. And we're looking at the endocardial fibroelastosis once again, which is present on the papillary muscles and the septal surface. The way to do this echocardiographically is to increase the dynamic range of the echocardiogram so that the grade scale is maximized and then it is possible to see this. And it is largely appropriate to look at this in axial rather than lateral resolution. When we look at the long axis, I've tilted this heart around so that it conforms with the echocardiogram. So the apex of the right ventricle is down here. This is the right atrial appendage. Here is the large pulmonary trunk continuous with the open right ventricle. And the small ascending aorta, we cannot see down to the level of the sinuses valsalva, which we can do on the echocardiogram. And on the echocardiogram, you can see this two to three millimeter a chamber here, the left and right atriums and the right ventricle, as well as the sinuses of our salva and the left, the right coronary artery arising off this particular chamber. And not only is that information there, but as you superimpose color flow information on this, you can see the red jet of the retrograde flow perfusing the coronary artery. Now we'll expand this a little bit further as uh, Professor Addison had shown earlier on. Uh, you can see this tiny little ascending aorta which can be uh, recognized echocardiographically. And here I've highlighted the uh, retrograde flow in red coming around from the duct and then perfusing the ascending aorta. And when you Doppler in this position right over here with this reference image, you can see that there is a retrograde flow around the aortic arch towards the vessels, the head and neck and the uh, aorta, and then retrograde flow backwards during diastole. Uh, the next uh, group is uh, mitral stenosis and aortic stenosis. You see the small left ventricle and aorta. I'll put this into play and you can see that in this patient, the aortic valve is patent and moving uh, the um, mitral valve is stenotic, the ventricle is small and very poorly functioning ventricle. And below is a picture of the same features, but with a larger ventricle and Doppler color flow showing that the doming valve has a small jet of blood flow coming out, but not really supporting the entire circulation. Here is a, a, a uh, cut section from Diane Spicer's brilliant collection showing the stenotic mitral and aortic valve. And we will uh, put this into play to show here the large uh, transverse aorta tapering to a small uh, ascending aorta with the bulbous nature of this domed, partially open valve present here. And um, I'll just show you that we can correlate the echocardiogram to that by just simply turning the specimen around. As uh, Professor Anderson had mentioned, the presence of a uh, co-optation is critically important both before and after surgical repair of this condition. Here you can see a beautiful shelf in one of Diane Spicer's pictures, uh, which is juxtaductal at the level of the ductus, there's the ascending aorta. And on echocardiogram, you can see the ductus with this shelf-like lesion just present there. It's easier to see on the still frame than it is on the echo. When it's moving, I put the echo in motion to show that there is orange flow, which is coming towards the transducer, indicating retrograde flow around the arch before the bulbous uh, end of the aorta at the sinuses of Alsalva. More frequently, as Professor Anderson had shown earlier on, there is the subclavian artery, uh, and you can see the arterial duct right over here entering this, and the ductus shelf is actually proximal to the subclavian and also enshrouding the subclavian artery. And this is a much more typical appearance morphologically. And here on echo is that same picture, you can see this large ampulla of the arterial duct over here, the narrowing which is proximal to the uh, entrance of the arterial duct and the retrograde flow around from this arterial duct 
towards the subclavian and the rest of the aortic root. Another problem is atrial septal restriction. And then obviously this was important if one was following them in utero, but uh, we do see patients that uh, come in that don't have previous um, uh, fetal studies. So here is a uh, almost entirely closed atrial septum where the atrial septum has become aneurysmal because of increased left atrial pressures. This is the open right atrial appendage with the rest of the right ventricle and the coronary sinus seen here. And here is the echocardiogram showing you the same things with the pulmonary veins, which are dilated, draining into the small left atrium with a bulging atrial septum with a little foramen present over here, and the right and, uh, uh, atrium and ventricle and left ventricle are identified there. And in motion with color flow, you can see a small amount of uh, escape of the left atrial contents across the atrial septum at very high velocities, as you would Doppler in this region over here. And with the associated abnormal pulmonary blood flow, as you see here, and reminiscent of what is usually seen in fetal life with a low velocity flow and to and fro flow in the pulmonary veins. Another problem that Professor Anderson talked about was the presence of the uh, so-called vertical vein or lever atrial cortical vein, clearly a misnomer. And here, this vessel is arising from the origin of the left pulmonary veins, ascending as a vertical vein, crossing the bacrocephalic vein and entering the superior vena cava. This morphology is from the UCSF collection of a 12-year-old who survived with a aortic atresia with this condition related to the uh, pulmonary venous uh, uh, hypertension, keeping the arterial duct open for the duration of her life until she developed pulmonary vascular disease at six years of age. And when you look at one of these with a cross section, you can see the superior cava and the so-called three vessel view that you normally see, except there's the ascending aorta, this tiny little ditzel over there. But there is also another uh, vertical vein here, which the flow is reversed in direction because it's coming up. And when you turn the probe at 90 degrees to this particular vessel, you can see this vertical vein uh, causing blood to escape from the left atrium into the structure. And when you add the Doppler color flow, you can see that the velocity of flow is directed upwards towards the brachiocephalic vein. Now, we mentioned that, uh, the, that many of these patients are burnt out aortic stenosis. This is a patient who was uh, 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 born with a, a, a malfunctioning left ventricle, just as you see over here. The uh, EFE, endocardial fibrillastosis, had enshrouded the left ventricular outflow tract, further narrowing it. And the mitral valve is indeed, from the size of this here, it's also stenotic. And here you can see both a stenotic, very bizarre trijet uh, egress from the left atrium, as well as aortic insufficiency, I beg your pardon, mitral insufficiency, and a, a very poorly malfunctioning heart. And just to show another example of this, there is another example of the endocardial fibrinastosis in a left ventricle, which is of reasonable size, but with mitral stenosis and aortic stenosis as well. Now, I don't know how I am for time, Glowell. I'm going to be guided by you. Um, I have some uh, information on the post-operative evaluation, which is critical and also part of neonatal ultrasound examinations. We need a full echocardiographic examination. We need to examine the atrial communication, the adequacy of the pulmonary blood flow, the adequacy of the arterial communication, the Norwood anastomosis, ventricular function, tricuspid regurge, and the presence of effusions in general. We don't have time for that, so what I'm going to show you is the neo-aorta here. This is a subcostal sagittal cut. The old aorta here and the communication seen between the two, as you can see on this opened homograph with this tiny little hole representing the, um, the uh, communication. 
And on this example here, you can see the native tissue compared to the white homograph tissue, and again, the area of the anastomosis to the coronary system. We have to make sure that the atrial septum is open, and this needs to be done post-operatively as it can shrink down a little bit. We watch out to see that there's free flow as well as a small amount of AV valve regurgitation. When we look at adequate flow, you can see um, that there is a stenosis at the origin of the uh, uh, anastomosis to the right pulmonary artery in this particular uh, frame. So uh, it, it is important to look at the adequacy of uh, a BT shunt, as we see here, or the adequacy of a uh, homographed conduit, sano conduit from the uh, right ventricle into the aorta. I've magnified that here. And here is the native picture again, showing tricuspid regurgitation, flow into the neo-aorta with some insufficiency, the anastomosis, and the conduit uh, structure on this side here. I'll let it play till the end of the flow and you can see the conduit flowing in there. Tricuspid regurgitation, here is a, a surgeon has attempted to repair the tricuspid regurgitation, has uh, re limited the amount of tricuspid insufficiency, but has created a minor degree of stenosis. And here's a patient who had infective endocarditis and you can see that this valve tissue has really been destroyed. Now, my plea is always to look for co-optation of the Norwood operation as it will really profoundly affect the ventricle. And here you can see a classical area of narrowing even after surgery. This is the deepest and hardest area for the surgeon to get to. So I'm going to show you just that this as a last picture to keep in time that there are abnormal uh, pulsations in the abdominal aorta, and that uh, you will usually highlight that there is some disturbance of flow at the level of uh, the repaired co-optation. Uh, uh, you want me to do this, Will uh, or do you want me to stop? We are short on time. I would love to have you okay, do it. Okay, well then in that case, I think I will just leave this. Thank you very much for your time, uh, and thank you for having me on this program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the unique explanation, very clear. Every time is a real big opportunity to have you and to participate in your, uh, your lecture. Thanks again, Norman. We will see you soon, I'm sure. So we go ahead fast with uh, Professor uh, Gil Bernowski, who uh, don't need uh, any presentation. Of course, it's time to have a look to the physiology. And the question is a very important question. If, if it's time to change our approach or our mind to view these uh, very uh, complex congenital artifacts. Thanks, Gil. Can you hear me, guys? Yes, yes, very well. Uh, thanks for uh, all of the participants for joining, especially Norm and, and Chris and Shab from the West Coast of the US. Um, there's no chance that uh, we'll be able to stay on time, as we already know. And I've spoken with Sasha, and, and I thought that what might be reasonable is for me to show um, just a couple of highlight slides. I'll be recording a, uh, a longer version of this, and it will be on uh, both the, Child the Congenital Heart Academy website as well as the Society of Pediatric Cardiology Training Program a Director's site. To answer your question, Sasha, is it time to change uh, the way we think about this? Absolutely, um, because if nothing changes, nothing changes. And we're still uh, stuck with a situation where two thirds of our patients roughly don't make it to elementary school. And those that do have significant morbidity uh, and mortality and a shortened duration of life. So we can't be happy with what we already have. I'm gonna put a few plugs in. Um, let me see if I can advance my slides here. Gil, if you're getting the dinging, it means, oh, there you go, you're good. Um, I'll, I'll just mention that we've put an, a lot of thought into this and in, in Anderson's Pediatric Cardiology, there are six new chapters on rethinking all of this, both including what we already know and how we might change it. And I'm gonna use some slides from there. Um, the short version of this talk, you'll see the longer one, is to get rid of these terms. 
Um, I have to respectfully disagree with um, Dr. Del Nido, who spoke earlier on. This is not a parallel circulation. Transposition of the great arteries is a parallel circulation. We can't have both with two very different diseases. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the problem with the terms overcirculation and balancing the circulation. I think when we've used those terms appropriately um, or early on, uh, it made some sense. But as we learn more about the physiology, they are simplistic. They don't go over the entire complexity of both preoperative and postoperative care, and they're outdated. Um, one of the challenges that I have personally is that uh, I learned from people who coined those phrases, and I have used those phrases in this book and in other places you can see in this box, talking about balancing and QP to QS ratio and all those sorts of things. Again, I'm going to skip through the initial preoperative physiology because I want to try to catch us up in time, but this will give you an idea that I prefer to call this a multi-distribution circulation than a parallel circulation as the ventricular output is distributed into more than one vascular bed. Uh, the, single vent the term single ventricle is inaccurate as Professor Anderson has talked about for decades that we need to talk about a functionally univentricular heart. The anatomy does not determine the physiology in all of these cases, so we can't call it single ventricle physiology um, because patients with a common arterial trunk, pulmonary atresia with MAPCAs and others will have a complete mixing of the systemic and pulmonary venous return. So we're gonna try to change some of this thinking. And again, I'm gonna go uh, through this to get to some of the important issues about overcirculation, the QP to QS ratio uh, and whatnot. Uh, again, I'm going to, I apologize for jumping through all of this, but I'm going to do all the work that all of our fetal cardiologists have done in a very long time here. Here's the fetal flow. Uh, oxygen saturations in the fetus are low. Here's the postnatal flow. Uh, there's decreasing flow on the left side and increasing flow on the right side as pulmonary vascular resistance falls. And then as the duct constricts, we get a patient in shock. So what we talked about for a long time is we need to balance the circulation and we need to get the QP to QS ratio to one. So let's talk a little bit about what is this, what are we talking about with QP to QS? Well, first and foremost, it's a ratio. It does not talk at all about oxygen delivery. The formula for calculating this ratio has been known for many while. This is based on the inverted uh, formula from the Fick equation of how to measure pulmonary and systemic flow once one knows the oxygen consumption, the hemoglobin, and a variety of other issues. Now we've taught for a long time that because this is a single ventricle type of uh, mixing where there's complete mixing of the systemic and pulmonary venous return, by definition, the aortic and pulmonary artery saturations are equal. So let's substitute the aortic saturation here in the bottom of the equation. What about the lungs? Well, we make some assumptions that newborns have normal gas exchange, so we can put a 95 over there. Now, we all know that the mixed venous saturation in, in most of us is about 25% of our aortic saturation. So then we have put a 25 up there, and then we say, okay, we can use the pulse oximeter. And then for the longest time, we dumbed this down. I don't know how well that translates out of English, to that we should target a pulse oximeter of about 80. And I'll show you why that is totally wrong. But to quote uh, Mr. Mencken, there's always a well-known solution to every human problem that's neat and plausible, and as I'll show you, wrong. Um, we don't routinely measure the mixed venous saturation, um, and we don't really know what the pulmonary venous saturation is. So using this equation, when two of the three variables are assumed, is fundamentally flawed. And I'll give you a couple examples of that. So let's talk about the word balance, and the words are very important here. Let's say we have a baby with an aortic oxygen saturation of 60 and a saturation in the superior cable vein of about 25%. So we have a difference of 35%. We'll assume the lungs are normal in this patient. So we have a ratio here that's exactly one. So that patient should get a smiley face over here. But no, in fact, this patient is likely to have a cardiac arrest with a mixed venous saturation of 25%, as well as very low oxygen delivery. So having a QP to QS of one is a helpful 
concept, but it is not always correct. What about this oxygen saturation of 80% goal? What do we want the saturations to be? We hear that on rounds all the time. Well, here's a patient with a saturation of 80, but maybe they have a mixed uh, venous saturation of 30%. Now, this patient with the heart saturation is also likely to have a cardiac arrest and is in low cardiac output. And then we have the situation where a patient has a, quote, high oxygen saturation with a PO2. And I certainly have been in situations in my career where I generally can be very happy. Hey, is that good oxygen delivery? And there are other ways of looking at that. Oh, no, the patient is in difficulty. Certainly, have been, some of you may have been in the situation where there's a lot of franticism about what to do when the oxygen saturations are, quote, too high. And that could include a variety of uh, interventions on the baby uh, that are still routinely used and may be very helpful in certain patients. Please don't get me wrong. But the knee-jerk response when the oxygen saturation is, quote, high uh, to do something is a problem. And, and I was fortunate enough as a medical student to train with Bill Rashkin. And he told me once that the only thing you have to do, son, he said, uh, is think. And I could not agree with that more. So all ICU interventions cause harm. And you, the most important question when the oxygen saturation is high is, is the baby sick? Not what do you need to do? Is oxygen delivery low? Is it likely to continue to deteriorate? Again, so in the interest of time, I'm going to go through this quickly. And I'm going to show you one other slide um, that I hope helps with thinking about this concept. Uh, pulmonary overcirculation, which we've talked about many times, may matter if, incre if the increased pulmonary blood flow per se results in poor feeding, ventilation, are typical signs uh, of heart failure. But low systemic blood flow due to high pulmonary blood flow in isolation, at least in my experience, has been a rare event. What we can say is that pulmonary undercirculation matters, hypoxemia, and that systemic undercirculation does matter with poor oxygen delivery. So I would prefer to use the terms undercirculation when it matters rather than overcirculation, which uh, is nonspecific and then implies the lungs are the problem. So here's the problem with what we're talking about from a, simplistic, from a simplicity perspective. Systemic oxygen delivery is determined by the blood oxygen content. The ventricular output provides the systemic blood flow. The ventricular output is determined by preload, afterload, um, myocardial performance and heart rate. Uh, some of that ventricular output goes over here, and some may go backwards from tricuspid regurgitation. This is a complex arrangement. And to say that the balancing of those two components in that very complex tree is too simple and outdated. So one needs to think about all of these things in a patient that has inadequate systemic oxygen delivery rather than jumping right to the concept of pulmonary overcirculation. Uh, Tom Spray once said to me uh, something that I'll show you here, and I apologize for going through these fast. Again, we'll record this, is that the best way to limit pulmonary blood flow is with a tube of Gore-Tex. And uh, now that we are uh, actively participating alternative palliation or use that Gore-Tex to form pulmonary artery bands. But medical management of surgical disease does not work well. I'm gonna show two slides again uh, for a couple of plugs. The first uh, is to fill out the evaluation and Lowell's uh, address is right there. I do wanna mention that uh, a week, excuse me, on the 26th will be a comprehensive deep dive uh, into the single ventricle reconstruction trial for hypoplastic left heart syndrome with all of the main investigators. Uh, if you look at uh, the bit.ly link showed their SVR trial. You can register uh, for this. Um, and uh, I'm going to close at this point and thank you for your time. Now we have to introduce the... Hello? Gil, are you... We can hear you, Sasha. Yes, Gil. You have to start the last session. Gil disappear. <laughs> Wait. So we start with the, now the, the last session and uh, 
Of course, uh, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Peivandi, Shabnam Peivandi, and uh, she will talk about uh, in the session of the, what comes next is life after treatments, uh, quality of life. It means uh, we wait to, to, to understand is a very important part. Thank you, Shabnam. Thank you. Can you guys see my slides? Yes, we can see very well. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Gil um, Lowell and Dr. Agati for inviting me to present at this webinar. Good morning from San Francisco. So I'm going to talk about life after treatment in about 10 minutes. Um, so it's gonna be a pretty brief overview about what we know with regard to neurodevelopment and uh, quality of life in patients with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So as many of us know, um, if we look at one particular domain of cognitive outcome like IQ, patients with congenital heart disease, including those with HLHS, have slightly lower IQs compared to the general population and are much lower in the context of a concomitant uh, genetic disorder. The interesting part about neurodevelopment in our patients is that although there has been dramatic improvement in surgical outcomes as seen in this paper here, we have not seen similar trends with regard to neurodevelopmental outcomes. Here we can see that both motor and cognitive outcomes in infants has remained pretty constant since the 90s to the current era. And this can certainly be a result of uh, the fact that more complex patients are surviving and they're pulling these numbers down, but does demonstrate that neurodevelopmental impairments continues to be an issue uh, among our patients. And certainly complexity makes a difference. This is a paper from Gill that shows that the more complex or severe your heart defect is, the larger the percentage of patients uh, that are gonna have neurodevelopmental impairment although the severity of that impairment does vary uh, among the patients. We also know from the Pediatric Heart Network study that uh, neurodevelopmental impairments in HLHS begins in infancy. In particular, we know that these infants have uh, particular impairments in motor outcomes in infancy, and that these problems continue into childhood where motor delays in infancy transition into more developmental coordination disorders. There are a higher prevalence of language disorders, um, alarming rates of behavioral problems such as ADHD and autism-like behavior. And uh, up to 50% of these patients report uh, learning difficulties and requiring remedial services to overcome these issues. And certainly these issues continue into adolescence as well, but do become much more complex. And this is really a, as a result of a time period where these patients are expected to be more independent from their parents. Um, and we start to see issues emerge with executive functions, such as working memory and emotional control, as well as issues with social cognition and interaction, which is basically their ability to interact and comprehend emotion. And again, these aren't really that obvious when they're younger, but as they are expected to gain more independence, we start to see some of these issues emerge. And so this, what I've described is a somewhat a unique developmental profile that is, that is very unique to the patient with congenital heart disease, including HLHS. And many have coined this the neurodevelopmental signature of complex congenital heart disease where these patients may have near normal IQs on cognitive exams, but struggle significantly with academic achievement and their ability to perform everyday tasks. So you can imagine that over time, this can lead to significant issues with their ability to retain patient education, adherence to medical recommendations, transition to adult life, uh, completion of higher education, and the ultimate goal which is really societal contribution and their ability to be employed and independent in society. So fortunately, it's not all doom and gloom because we do know that early recognition of these issues can uh, help if we provide support and resources for our patients, they may be able to overcome some of these difficulties and essentially rewrite their outcome as it pertains to neurodevelopmental outcomes. 
The other area, though, that's been studied significantly is can we prevent these neurodevelopmental impairments? And there has been a lot of work done on identifying risk factors associated with impaired neurodevelopment. And this is by no means an exhaustive list of uh, papers, but does demonstrate the breadth of knowledge that we have. And these risk factors begin in fetal life and continue into adolescence. So for example, as we heard from Mary this morning, impaired oxygen and nutrient delivery to the developing fetal brain can be problematic. Whether or not you're prenatally diagnosed makes a difference. And then there are several preoperative intraoperative and postoperative risk factors that can influence one's neurodevelopment independent of other risk factors. Now, a particular uh, interest of mine is environmental risk factors and socioeconomic status and how that can influence these outcomes. And this is not unique to congenital heart disease. We do know that even in normal children, your parental education level and your sociodemographic status can influence developmental outcomes. Um, and so this uh, study that we participated in um, that was um, an abstract accepted to the Pediatric Academic Society about a month ago was a collaborative study we did with the University of Toronto led by Stephen Miller as well as our collaborators in Zurich where we pulled together our uh, imaging and outcome data. And this is neonatal brain imaging data. And we showed that amongst the patients with the lowest maternal education level, this includes patients with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, those babies had the smallest uh, uh, brains or total brain volume even before going to the operating room. And uh, similarly, lower maternal education was associated with worse cognitive outcomes in infancy and childhood. So a lot more for us to learn on how environmental risk factors can influence this particular outcome. So you can imagine that these neurodevelopmental impairments can have negative consequences towards one's mental health. And we're fortunate to work with a lot of smart psychologists and neuropsychologists who have shown us that mental health is a major issue amongst our patients. And about a third of Fontan patients meet diagnostic criteria for anxiety and depression. And we're also learning that maternal stress, particularly beginning in utero, can have negative consequences to the developing fetus and can continue to impact that child throughout the lifespan. So it's an area and a domain that we need to pay attention to. So I'm getting to the question of whether life after treatment can be considered a quote, quality life. And I think this is a difficult question to answer. There have certainly been several papers looking at health-related quality of life in Fontan patients in particular. And um, <clears throat> fortunately for me, for me, this was summarized nicely in a meta-analysis published just a couple months ago in JAHA. And it is true that both patient-reported and parent-reported health-related quality of life is lower in Fontan patients compared to a healthy reference population. And these issues are seen across all domains, including physical, social, emotional, and school uh, functions. And importantly, they are mediated by not just your medical or clinical status, but also by demographic factors that are unique to each patient. But I think it's also important to note that there's a lot of variability noted across these studies. So it's really difficult to look at the mean and uh, make a sort of a blanket statement about health-related quality of life. And um, the case in point is our colleagues in Austria uh, published a study a couple months ago about their cohort and quality of life and showed that some, many of their patients actually report a pretty uh, normal quality of life and their per perception of their illness is actually not as bad as we think. So there's a whole lot of variability. So to conclude, I think uh, to talk about life after treatment is a very complex paradigm. It uh, includes uh, things like neurodevelopmental outcome, your medical and physical status, as well as your psychosocial health. And all of these components uh, interact with one another and in combination influence one's perception of their quality of life. And this particular out outcome compared to other outcomes that we study is very individualized because it really depends on where that child is coming from 
including their demographic factors, their support structure at home, uh, coping skills, and their uh, resilience. So as we start to think about targeted interventions to optimize outcomes, it's, it's important to take uh, sort of a, this individualized approach to be able to optimize those outcomes. Thank you. Thanks, Shab. Great. Th thanks, Shab, so much. That was excellent. Um, as we saw from our poll earlier, the plurality of our participants right now are um, medical cardiologists. And I think your presentation nicely shows that we can ask about chest pain and palpitations, but if we're not asking about how they're doing in school and other related issues, we're really not doing as good a job as we should. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce our final speaker of the day. Dr. Christina Ronai is joining us from Oregon Health Sciences University Jordan Becker Children's Hospital in Portland, Oregon. And she is going to be speaking on provider perspectives on the role of palliative care in hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Can you hear me? <clears throat> You're good now, Chris. Okay. Uh, well, thank you so much for this invitation. Um, I'm just trying to get it into presentation mode. There we go. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for this invitation. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone that's hanging on to the very end. Uh, it is my pleasure to uh, speak to you today about provider perspective on palliative care and HLHS. So I think an important question is to start with is what does palliative care mean to families and providers? Because I think that there's been a longstanding perception that this can perhaps be we've given up on the patient, it's time to have come to the end of our care, and now we're gonna to turn to the palliative care team. And I think that palliative care tends to mean to families uh, what we pitch it as. So um, and we're gonna walk through a little bit of the literature. I think there's been an explosion recently in sort of provider attitudes to palliative care, when we should involve palliative care in our patients with hypoplastic left hearts, care team. Um, and I think that uh, this article down at the bottom by Davis et al. is a really nice example of the National Pediatric Cardiology Quality Improvement Collaborative, or NPCQIC, since that's a little bit of a mouthful, has really pushed the early integration of palliative care into the care team uh, for families with children with hypoplastic left heart. Um, similarly, um, we recently published in Oregon um, about when we should involve uh, palliative care in hypoplastic left heart, which is, I think, how I ended up with this topic. Um, and again, I think that, you know, Jack Rychek out of CHOP, you know, really talked a lot about what does palliative care mean in the prenatal diagnosis of congenital heart disease. And then uh, Hancock et al. had a very nice uh, study that looked at a randomized trial, actually, for when you involve palliative care and what is the effect on maternal stress. So I think all of this really stems nicely after um, Shab's talk um, about quality of life. And I would really like to talk about the fact that when you query people, just like we did at the very beginning of this, about what is the preferred palliation for um, complicated hypoplastic left heart at your institution, uh, Yates et al. published this in 2011. And obviously, you can see down here that hospice, which is sort of what we think about palliative care, was way down at the bottom. And my talk today is really not about, you know, should we be offering palliative care as one of our strategies right after birth? Uh, I'm happy to talk more about that. But really, when do you involve the palliative care team as part of your multidisciplinary approach to hypoplastic left heart syndrome? So I think this is a really important statement um, to help us guide when we should involve palliative care. And the AAP really does support an integrated model of palliative care in which the components of palliative care are offered at diagnosis and continued through the course of illness, whether the outcome ends in cure or death. Obviously, we know for hypoplastic left heart, we're not curing the anatomy that patients are born with. And I think it's important when we describe these as all of us do who do fetal counseling, we call the surgeries that we offer these families palliative surgeries. We never use the word repair because we're not making their heart look like a four-chambered, four-valved heart. And so I think that really, if you think about this new sort of model that palliative care is coming up with and that it's somebody, it's a group that walks along that journey with the family, 
I think that really helps about when we should think about involving them. Uh, this nice study came out of uh, Boston, but it is a multidiscipline. It's a multi-center study that um, asked CT surgeons about when palliative care should be involved, and these are some of their reasons that they're reluctant to con reluctant to consult palliative care. So parents will think I'm giving up on their child is a huge, huge concern for families. Um, and second to that is referring to palliative care services too early will undermine parent hope. Um, or that the medical team will not try as hard if palliative care is involved. And I think that this really speaks to when you involve the palliative care team. I think that if you involve palliative care at a moment of crisis, that is probably very much the perception that uh, care teams and providers may well have, as well as the family, that we've reached the end of the road for what we can offer. Um, I think interestingly, it is a similar group that put together this next study that was more about pediatric cardiology providers. You can see the same themes here, that parents will think that I'm giving up on their child. Um, palliative care referral is not acceptable to parents. I think we hear this a lot um, from centers that don't have it as a routine part of their counseling, um, that if a family has decided that they want to go forward with the pregnancy and then the subsequent surgeries, that interjecting palliative care in there is us sort of undermining their choice. Uh, but I think that this is really nice um, that even in the CT surgeon's mind, the appropriate timing for palliative care consultation, now obviously it's not all of them, but they think that at the time of prenatal diagnosis is a really great time to involve the palliative care team as opposed to their second highest response was when surgical and transcatheter options have been exhausted. So I think we're moving the pendulum on where and how we think about palliative care for these families. So when should we involve the team? During fetal counseling, after delivery, after Norwood, or when things start to go wrong? Um, I'll tell you that we had um, 90 people complete our survey. Obviously it was a single center uh, study. It was just done at Dornbecker, but we did include the ICU doctors, both in the PICU and the NICU, our maternal fetal medicine colleagues, and then actually all of the nurses that touch these patients along their life span. And um, you can see that the overwhelming majority thought that the prenatal period was a great time to involve the team um, or just prior to surgical intervention. I think that the themes that came out because we enabled people to have some free text responses, I think are really important and I think really do speak to the way that we're moving ahead in the way we think about palliative care. It's not somebody that we involve when we're just trying to make the patient comfortable. That's Their role is expanded to be much, much more than that. And it's an expanded support network for our families as we, um, as we walk the journey with our families through this single ventricle journey. I think it's really important for there to be what I like to describe it as somebody who's taking a little bit more of the thousand foot view. I routinely like to think that I'm taking that thousand foot view, but I think that the palliative care team actually does a really phenomenal job of helping the family both with siblings and how you talk to other family members about what is going on. Um, so it really is an expanded support network for the family. It decreases the family stress during the postnatal period. Um, an increased patient education about what to expect and how to prepare for the postnatal period, and then continuity of care. I can tell you that our experience here is that the families that have met our palliative care team prenatally, which is now a requirement as I'll go to the next page, um, if you're diagnosed at OHSU with single ventricle heart disease, um, you are required to have a palliative care consult. And I actually think that by making it a requirement, it doesn't become that it's a judgment on any one of the pediatric cardiologists, you know, oh, your baby's not gonna do very well. It's much more that this is somebody that we want all of our families to meet with so that it's an added layer of support. Um, and the families love it because the palliative care team will stop by when they're in the NICU waiting for surgery and really just talk to the family, not about the upcoming surgery, just really talk to them about, look how beautiful your baby is and be very much that other added support. And then we found that when things go wrong, it's so nice for the families and the palliative care team to not be meeting these families in a time of crisis because it's an opportunity for the palliative care team to check back in on what their goals were for their child. I think that, again, we're not saying that 
a palliative care consult during the fetal period means that we're not going to offer surgery. And we're very clear about that. And I think that a lot of what we're doing is really trying to reframe what people think when they hear palliative care and that it is truly somebody to walk that journey with them. Um, and with that, I will end um, because I'm happy to take questions on how we do it here in Oregon. Thanks, Chris. Sasha, um, we don't have the, um, at least I don't have the Q&A function on my, uh, yes, on my computer. And, it, and we've been going three hours and 50 minutes. Yes, this is the. So what I think what we're, uh, excuse me, two hours and 50 minutes. I think what we are um, going to do is we're going to be posting all of this on the uh, Congenital Heart Academy website. Um, I personally want to thank all of the speakers. Um, I think it would be a decent idea or a good idea in, Low, in Lowell's survey for the evaluation, which is there, yes. um, that we uh, have the free text box about what went well, especially what didn't. Any suggestions for us to do a better job with this? It, it's, it's very nice to hear how everything was nice, but it's even more important that we hear things we could make better from your perspective. Um, I'm sorry, there were, we capped at a thousand. I think we had 18 or 1900 registrants and we were not necessarily prepared for the interest in this. Um, and then uh, I do want to remind people that the follow up of, of this wonderful review will be uh, next week, excuse me, on the 26th. Uh, and if you log on to the bit.ly link SVR trial, you'll have the opportunity uh, to see and learn about that one. Um, so with that, Sasha, if it's okay with you, did you yes. have a, did you have uh, a I have two, two, three things to say. One is that uh, I would like to confirm our uh, uh, cooperation with the Hart University. We just, Justin, at, uh, yesterday we have a very good uh, discussion. So what they are doing is amazing. We are doing, uh, uh, we are supporting them. We are doing something to help uh, uh, the science. So. Uh, it's a very big opportunity again to share or to have a relation with them. I will ask if there is, a, because uh, for the next appointment, as you say, will be the single ventricle trial reconstruction. But as you promise, we have a, a new appointment on uh, June 4. We will decide the best time about transposition of the grid arteries. We have already. Uh, working, uh, we promised for this uh, week with uh, Professor Bernowski. And I will ask uh, Vivian Nasr from Boston to open the, the, um, the microphone because she is going to arrange the meeting on uh, 11 June about pediatric anesthesia update 2020. And 18 of June, we have uh, ECMO, we will uh, have uh, inside uh, our program deck with uh, Grace Walluen, we have that I would like to thank because as you saw in the poll, most of the penetration in the South America, I'm sure coming from uh, a lot of contacts that uh, she had already. So thank you very much. I will uh, update uh, the, all the information on uh, uh, the YouTube channel. I will try to inform you every day with, uh, every time with Professor Bernowski on, uh, on our social. So I will ask, uh, so the next appointment is uh, June 4, uh, about transposition of the great arteries. If uh, Vivian is there, please, if you can open or if you are not there. Hi. I'm here, Sasha. Hi. Yes. Hi. <laughs> How are you? Hi, Gail. Hi, Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for the speakers. I cannot and see you, that. but I can you. Can yes. you see me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you everyone. And uh, as everyone said, it's good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's great to see people from all around sharing this. Um, I'm happy and uh, honored to present the next webinar on June 11. So we will be talking about updates in pediatric cardiac anesthesia. I know on the poll, it shows that anesthesia were around 4%, but I think the topics that we'll cover will be interesting for everyone. We're hoping to talk about enhanced recovery and regional anesthesia and cardiac surgery, uh, talking about kidney injury on bypass and uh, potentially talking about blood management as well. We have a few confirmed 
different speakers and we will send, uh, Sasha will share the more detailed outline once we have everyone confirmed as well as the titles. Uh, so I hope to see many of you, even though not anesthesiologist on June 11. And uh, uh, it has been great. Sharing this experience has been awesome. Thank you, Gil, and thank you, Sasha. And thanks, thanks. to Rosanna, who's the anesthesiologist at Tyromina as well. <laughs> <laughs> so Grace, are you there? Yes. Hi, everybody. Uh, it was a pleasure to listen to all of you. Thank you very much for uh, these amazing talks. And thank for the audience from all over the world. We are very happy for that. And so on June the 18th, we are going to have uh, one meeting uh, to talk about uh, ECMO. That is something that is very uh, important in our field. And we are preparing something very nice to all of you. And I want to thank all the committee from uh, Congenital Heart Academy, Sasha and Gail especially, and to ask to all of you to speak to us on Twitter, on uh, our YouTube channel, and on LinkedIn. That's what the social media that we have so far. We are working on more than that, and our emails are always open to all of you. We want to listen from you. We are going to communicate through all these channels with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Grace. Grace, do we have plans for Sasha to do a TikTok video? I want to be sure we cover all of the social media type things. Oh my God, they have so many ideas. <laughs> so thank you very much. I will see you on uh, June, for June. Thank you very much to everybody. See you, Sasha. Bye. You want to say hello? You can say hello. Hi from Atlanta. Sasha, can you put up uh, Lowell's, um, uh, Frank Lowell's connection? Yes. I will put it up myself. I, you are right because I searched you. With Bill, you was there? I'm here. I don't know where, I don't know where Frank is. I'm Lowell. right here. It's Lowell. Right here. Lowell's my first right. name. And yeah. you guys, please. All right. So Lowell Frank at childrensnational.org. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. L Frank, not Lowell Frank, but L Frank. Uh, yes, I, I can actually, you know, I can read English sometimes. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Bye. Bye, Bill. <laughs>